Okay, welcome back, uh, everyone. For those who are joining us just this afternoon, um, my name is uh, Pierre Belanger. I'm an associate professor uh, of landscape architecture here at the Graduate School of Design. Um, thank you for joining us for uh, the second half of uh, the panel sessions this afternoon. Uh, we've heard this. Uh, I think we. I think we can agree on. Um, it's been. Um, an enriching morning discussion of um, shit, water, roads, oceans, uh, kite aerial photography, uh, the planet, um, as well as um, a favorite subject of the subterranean. Um, I think we can continue with this conversation this afternoon. Um, we have um, uh, a, a, a really interesting group of people that um, Chris Reed and Nina Marie Lister will uh, introduce in a moment. I'd just like to mention here to remind everyone that um, in addition to the compounding discussion from this morning on the redefinition of infrastructure uh, that led into a discussion about the representation of infrastructure itself, um, it's clear that the singularity of the notion of infrastructure itself uh, needs to weaken vis-a-vis -vis a number of different formats of infrastructures themselves. I'd just like to mention here that uh, the third panel that will be then followed by um, a final, final roundtable discussion, um, this third roundtable on rebuilding infrastructure is aimed to address a number of projects, practices, and applications of certain ideas that we've seen and other ones that will be introduced this afternoon. Um, uh, Chris Reed, and Nina Marie Lister will be your moderators for the afternoon. Chris Reed is uh, founder uh, and principal of Stoss Landscape Urbanism, an award-winning award uh, landscape architecture uh, urban design firm here in Boston, as well as adjunct associate professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture. And Nina Marie Lister is associate professor um, uh, from Ryerson University, the School of Urban and Regional Planning, as well as visiting associate professor here in the Department of Landscape Architecture. They're both working on a collaborative project, co-editing a book that's the outcome of Symposium Critical Ecologies from a couple of years ago. So I think it's fitting that they steer us into the conversation of the application of ecological systems as drivers for future infrastructure. Chris Reed, Nina Marie Lister. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Pierre. Um, and, and really, thank you, Pierre, for convening us. I mean, um, already this morning, it's been an incredibly energizing and enlightening um, conversation. So uh, we're really going to blow it open this afternoon. Um, this is the marathon session. We have more speakers this afternoon than you had this morning in combination. Fortunately, according to the timetable you outlined last night, which I believe was about 36 hours, it means we have about nine hours to get through this. So I think we'll be all right. Um, in an era in which scientific and ecological thinking has shifted so dramatically uh, from Newtonian understandings of stability and permanence to more recent ideas about dynamism, change, and adaptation, um, in an era where these shifts have also included fairly radical recategorizations, development of new terminologies. And here I nod to um, Earl's presentation this morning, where he's starting to, to help us shift the, the, the focus in quite specific ways about how is it that we talk about the physical, phenomenal, dynamic world. Within these contexts, how does the work of designers, engineers, scientists engaged in infrastructural, landscape, ecological research and practice change? What are the implications conceptually, technically, physically, phenomenally, managerially? Of course, these are questions at the core of my own work, at the core of Nina Marie's work. We both teach, we both research, we both practice. Uh, and as Pierre said, we collaborate as well. Um, it's really a question at the core of, of, of this uh, critical and projective ecologies project that Nina Marie and I are uh, working on, in which we st are studying the various relationships between scientific research, design thinking, and management practices over the past two decades and into the future, where we begin to translate ideas about system thinking 
and dynamics, into representations and projections, um, into applications for practice moving forward. Of course, these questions are also at the core of some of the work here at the GSD. And what I'm showing you on screen is an animation um, that was developed in a course studio um, that I teach, that Nina Marie has interacted in, um, in landscape architecture, on urbanism. This is work by Thomas Folk, Sarah Nui, Lauren McClure, Amna Chowdhury, where they're studying environments of accumulation and adaptation around oyster breeding. What they're looking at are very reciprocal and iterative relationships between water flow, oyster growth, and changes in local physical environments that then alter water flow, oyster growth, and physical environments. And so there's an iterative and adaptive process that they're be beginning to engage in a way that's not just analytical, that begins to project new futures, that begins to imagine new futures at the interface of city and ocean. And so here you have a series of landscape architecture students with backgrounds in the humanities and architecture, um, looking at research developed by scientists and, and ecologists, adapting the tools and techniques of hydrologic engineers, um, and engaged in an imaginative and cultural enterprise um, looking toward uh, the future. In all of this is a deliberate collusion of scientific research agendas and discovery, design thinking, engineering advances, and management practices that can produce new worlds. For those of us in the realm of design and planning, this kind of work raises questions of how we learn from advances in scientific thinking, how we allow for collaborative thinking that can reshape the nature of the work we do, and how we might be capable of developing integrative models and strategies that we can offer back um, to our scientific colleagues and out to the greater world. Of course, these questions and opportunities are really the focus of this panel, which Pierre's titled Rebuilding Infrastructure, Ecological Engineering, Soft Systems, Economic Synergies. And I just want to quote a couple passages from the, the brief uh, that he gave us for this panel. He says, contemporary cities now require multifunctional infrastructures, greater social synergies, and higher degrees of ecological intelligence that cut across geopolitical boundaries, and I'd add disciplinary boundaries, in order to thrive. The linear, fixed, and closed mechanisms of the industrial economy must yield to flexible, circular, and network systems of urban ecologies. The readaptation and renewal of infrastructure is imperative in creating a life support system for the future. With that, we do have eight speakers in six slots this afternoon. They come from a wide range of backgrounds, geology, plant sciences, and botany, ecology, civil and hydrologic engineering, ec economics, architecture, landscape, and urbanism. And what's interesting about every single one of them is that they're engaged in some way or another in both research and application, research and practice. The first of these speakers uh, is Wendy Goldsmith. Wendy is the CEO and founder uh, of the Bioengineering Group, which she started uh, a number of years ago uh, up in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, Wendy's background spans geology, plant and soil science, uh, ecological planning, water quality, quality management, and river restoration um, design. Wendy has pioneered um, bioengineering techniques, which she'll begin to um, talk about. And I think it's, it's, it's quite significant. Uh, I've known Wendy for, what, 10, 12 years now. Uh, Neil Kirkwood introduced us uh, a while back. And I think what's significant about Wendy's practice is that she's taken on, really developed, pioneered a new kind of engineering in a very um, uh, constrained discipline. Um, and I, I, I don't think it's insignificant that she's done this as a woman working in a male-dominated uh, discipline. Um, she's been recognized widely 
um, for the work that she does. Uh, I think she was recently named one of the top 50 entrepreneurs by Fortune magazine, and she's now an advisor to the White House. It's with great pleasure I bring you Wendy Goldsmith. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, let's see if this gets me my presentation. I'd like to point out that Bioengineering Group just celebrated its 20th anniversary in business. And I also can't resist making the point that Pierre interned with us for a little while, and it was easily a dozen years ago. So um, uh, it's actually been some time since I uh, gave a talk in this hall. And so I'm happy to bring some recent achievements and some things that have been happening on a longer term trajectory. Um, I, I would agree with something Chris said, that it is uh, noteworthy that as a woman in the engineering and construction business, handling issues of infrastructure, um, usually I stand out. It's actually very heartening to be looking at a room that is so diverse in terms of gender, different disciplines, different national origins, and obviously different types of perspective from the research to the practice, to the policy, to the teaching cycle, because these things all are part of a cycle. Cycles are something you're going to hear me talk about. Linkage is something you're going to hear me talk about. And hopefully a sense of optimism and uh, a roadmap for action is something you can come away with. I, I hope you won't think I'm shameless as I talk about some of the work that my firm, which is not just about me, I'll take some credit and I'll take some blame for some things that we've done, um, but we are a group, and we are a very strong interdisciplinary team. And I would like to put out myself and the team of scientists, engineers, landscape architects, and construction managers and energy managers that we are. I'd like to put us out as an example of empowerment and leadership, something that can be emulated and that actually it takes people with a strong interest in training and skill set um, in, in design to do. Um, I also have to credit Pierre with pulling together a phenomenally structured program, and I won't, you know, I, I won't resist saying the following. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has been our single biggest client. They were our first repeat customer where we started doing R&D projects for them 20 years ago, and I will tell you some of the other things we have continued doing for them to this day. But it was almost to the month, six years ago, that I said in one of our very important off-site strategic planning retreats for the company, I named for that year, and it's really been for the rest of my career, I think, um, my personal professional goal was to infiltrate and influence the Army Corps of Engineers, to take all the great power and all the great influence that that organization has and co-opt it to make them agents of sustainability. I also just learned this last week that um, I was selected to receive an honor medal issued by the Army Corps of Engineers for outstanding service to them. And this medal, the De Fleury Medal, is named after a French engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so you can determine if I've, um, if I've perhaps been co-opted or if maybe we're having an impact and maybe that can inspire people to rise out and do the same. This is a little breakdown of who we are inside of the bioengineering group. And I'll point out that last year we actually broke having set, broke the figure of having 70, oh, we, have over, we reached over 70 in staff. Now I'm cheating a little, because we've actually backed off a little bit. Many of the construction management personnel we had at our peak levels were tied to meeting some very critical deadlines down in the greater New Orleans area, as I'll show you. But it's interesting that we have a very strong mixture of engineers, scientists, and designers, and many like myself wear many different hats with multiple facets of training. We started out doing um, engineering of ecosystems, small scale things, increasingly larger things, but perhaps most relevant to many people here is when we started becoming not the building designers, but we would do lead-based site design and infrastructure design. And some of our regional projects, you could possibly go take a ride out the Minuteman bike trail and visit are the Lexington Department of Public Works. 
um, where we had lots of green infrastructure. I think we've come this far in the symposium without hearing the term green infrastructure. So here I will introduce it, and I'm sure it's familiar already. Um, the first time that the Army Corps of Engineers went to adopt green building methods, um, it was almost an accident that they came to tap us. And it's also rather unusual to have uh, an, an, a science and engineering and design firm that doesn't include architects being the prime contractor directing the architects. But that's what we did here. And I think it's worth mentioning because I think it helped us plan a very context sensitive and site specific approach to three border patrol stations up on the northern uh, main border. And these were the first projects that the Army Corps undertook anywhere using lead-based design principles. And not only were they successful, but many people who worked on that project report back that it was a transformational process for them. And unlike some of our other projects, which have actually won AIA Top 10 Green Awards and many other accolades, this one actually won the Construction Management of America Award for Top Federal Project back in 2007. It was for being on time, on budget, no change orders. And at the time, the Corps was really shocked by this because they were sure all this green design, schmeen design was going to just foul everything up. And so they said, maybe it was the linkages. Maybe it was that interdisciplinary process that actually translated into savings of time and money uh, for the project as a whole. So um, it was after Katrina hit but before we were playing any formal role, despite having tried for over a decade to get involved in um, the large-scale landscape design and planning needs of greater uh, southern, southern Louisiana. But it was at that time that I saw a tremendous opportunity for us to take our history of first-of-kind projects for the Army Corps and to help them expand their perspective and expand beyond their comfort zone as they approached things in Louisiana. And in fact, um, we had a strategy that together we crafted, and it far exceeded our greatest hopes. Uh, because not only did we get involved, we actually got put in charge, essentially, of the whole program. Um, I had decided that to craft a dream team that could address this, a small, American-based, interdisciplinary, policy into practice, research into practice type firm joined up in a joint venture with the leading Dutch sea defense firm, that that would be a team to watch. And so we formed that team, and we came away not just winning some work and having some influence, but we actually won the single largest engineering contract that the federal government has issued ever for $150 million. And then because we were doing well, they gave us another one that we call the small one because it's only a $50 million design contract. But what was key here is that we helped to shape the future of infrastructure management um, with this project because uh, for the first time, it's a risk-based approach. It's a resilient, climate change adaptable, multiple lines of defense approach that integrates hard infrastructure uh, soft solutions ranging from reinvigorating the health and productivity of thousands of acres of marshlands, but also engaging the community to understand the need for evacuation, planning, changes in building codes, and so forth. And to accomplish this, we brought uh, a, a strong foundation in earth sciences. Here we see uh, you know, here's the Mississippi River flowing down and down and down. This is New Orleans, Lake Pontchartrain. The river flows down and ultimately out the Bird's Foot Delta. This whole arcing area is the, the fan of sediments laid down by the Mississippi River over the last 6,000 years. It looks like land on the map. It's certainly not the ocean, but it really isn't land either. Down, in, down at the Army Corps, they refer to it as muck on magma. There's nothing solid down there, which makes it a very challenging place to plan for and to engineer anything upon structurally. 
the area also does many other things. Here's a little diagram talking about how the Mississippi Corridor and all the tributaries to it function as a major uh, migratory pathway for birds. I like to illustrate this one, but I can't miss mentioning that it's also the main waterborne highway for the goods that come out of America's heartland, our only remaining substantial export product, grain. Um, and if you look at transportation infrastructure, there is no more sustainable method than waterborne transportation. Many people have said, why are you trying to save New Orleans? Why did you want to get involved with that? It's like, well, if you don't preserve water access to the mouth of the Mississippi River, you isolate middle America and really the entire American economy, not only from the global commerce, but you eliminate the ability for us to expand our use of highly efficient, energy efficient, waterborne transportation. And in the last three years alone, the Department of Transportation has crafted as its major national transportation policy the idea of the uh, marine highway where goods come around the globe, up rivers, then they fan out on rail systems and they just make the last mile or two on a truck bed different way to use fuel to move goods around in our increasingly globalized economy. This is a little map showing the delta lobes. Here's the Mississippi River coming down, and notice even the Mississippi River moves around. But basically, you know, one year, it, one or <laughs> for 500 years, it pushes sediment out here, and then it switches over here, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now it's coming out here, and it's about time for it to shift. You can even predict where it's going to want to shift, but we've been straightjacketing it and preventing it. So a lot of our process of understanding the issues and the strategies for designing infrastructure solutions in southeast Louisiana is contingent on understanding the very dynamic and inevitable future processes that have shaped the area and will continue to do so. Also looking at how some of the problems and challenges there link potentially in some interesting and synergistic and you know, important ways to other problems. Um, the redder it is, the faster the land is being lost. But then there's this big yellow blob, which I noticed on a couple of the earlier aerials we were shown. By, a couple people showed this whole gulf hypoxia. Basically all of the agricultural excess nitrogen, but the vast majority of it, over half of it, literally comes out of the wastewater treatment facilities in Chicago and makes its way all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico where it obliterates available oxygen levels and creates what's known as the dead zone. So if you look at it from the human flooding point of view in New Orleans, um, you know, here's Lake Pontchartrain, downtown New Orleans, the river flowing by. Um, here's Lake Bourne and the area that was originally identified as the spot to put the Lake Bourne surge barrier. Everything in yellow or red here is a piece of infrastructure that has been part of the post-Katrina hurricane uh, system. And we have touched over half of that, and we've been responsible for mapping out the overall picture. And in order to do this, one of the first interesting moments was that the Corps of Engineers, they can, they can build you a fish, right? Well, so they said, we are going to stand up the Hurricane Protection Office, which they did. That was the office that issued our contracts. And then they immediately said, oh, wait, maybe that's the wrong paradigm. So they came up with a new acronym, not the HPO. They went to the HISDERS. And this, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> the HISDERS. And, and it, uh, it stands for Hurricane Storm Damage Risk Reduction System. It's a mouthful, but it's a very important concept. And it came from a very humbling realization that if you say we're protecting you, people are going to be even less likely to evacuate. And there's no such thing as a system that works perfectly in all scenarios. So this idea of communication with the public, engagement with a deeper level of public understanding, and a sense of risk, and a sense of that risk, those risk factors changing over time due to scientific uncertainties and changes in, you know, we actually have the ability to influence sea level rise in the future if we choose. But we, we basically developed the system that would allow a very institutionalized process for design and construction and operations and maintenance in the future to meet and blend with this risk-based paradigm. It's a huge shift. And it involved partnering 
not only with other architecture and engineering firms that were part of our team, but the other teams that were responsible for other pieces of the overall infrastructure system. It involved working with many different divisions, you know, divisions and district offices within the Army Corps of Engineers, as well, of course, as all the local stakeholders. And the scale, this is, a, this is one of those beautiful vanishing point photographs. The scale of so many of these infrastructures is uh, difficult, if not impossible, to capture with a camera. And this one, um, the only open water storm barrier in this hemisphere can be seen from space and had its own Build It Bigger show on the Discovery Channel. <sighs> Actually, what's most interesting about this is it was executed in a form of public-private partnership. In this case, the financing did not come from a private sector, although that's a fascinating discussion we should have a whole another symposium on. It's how to fund these things and how to find the business case for it. But this one did involve, this was the first, this is a one point, well, this is a one and a half billion dollar piece of infrastructure, and it was carried out on a design build basis, which meant that it could be done within a five year period instead of the 20 year period that would normally be required, and I could outline why, but trust me, it's true. And so the, the, the method of delivering this piece of infrastructure was equally as innovative and challenging and important as all the technical knowledge and practice that went into it. Um, in addition to the barriers of the water, you know, to keep the water out, there were lots of other systems to move water away and so on. Um, and the scale of these levees, again, was just huge with enormous volumes of concrete, um, steel I-beams, and in fact, I'll point out here, here's a truck carrying a 150 foot long steel pile. It's the longest length that you can carry on a highway. The roads that had to be built so that the levees could be built were them in themselves a massive infrastructure undertaking. And as, as our team worked on this, at one point we said, okay, so we have all these cutoff barriers to keep the seepage from happening. We have all of these huge underpinning structures to allow these walls to stand on this weak, sloppy old soil. What, there's a tremendous amount being spent there, and maybe there's another way to make this do double duty. And we, we said, what if we made some modifications to the slab and added a couple extra pilings, and we did all of the geotechnical and structural analysis, not because it was in our scope, which it was not, but because we said, the people who are going to be responsible for maintaining this levee corridor forever don't have, they have a dwindling population basis and they don't have any money to do it. What if they leased this corridor to a wind developer, for example? That would be a revenue stream. So we identified what would create the applicable slab for attaching a monopole to allow the entire corridor to be populated with wind turbines. And where could the cabling system fit, and so on. And we also identified um, the biomass crop of switchgrass that could be used so that mowing, instead of being an expense, could now become a revenue stream. And we did all the business analysis for this, and we did all of the structural analysis, and we actually have developed quite a lot of interest in this. It, is, it has not been incorporated across the board yet, <laughs> but there are pieces of it that are in the planning phase. And it all involves with how you draw the boundary around your system. And we see everything here as being part of an ecosystem which is inherently full of cycles and things being attached and things having poetic multiple layers of meaning and purpose. This is not a dense report. This is an elegant sonnet if you're doing your job right. And, you know, just like the basic concept in nature is you have these trophic levels. Every time you go from primary production through different levels of consumption, you, you actually lose energy along the way. But those outputs of energy and material are captured and used in other little eddies within this cycling system. And watersheds are the unit in which water is moving through and connecting and linking all of these materials. After starting to work on larger and larger infrastructure systems, I found myself leafing back through one of my old um, 
terrestrial ecology textbooks. And I, I started also, then I started looking on the internet actually, to, and I, I found something amazing. Um, the author I quoted most heavily in my uh, undergraduate research thesis, in his later years, um, wound up coming up with some tremendous insights as an ecologist, as a systems thinker primarily, on how energy flows through large systems. He really came up with the, he, know, he observed the fact that we talk a lot about thermodynamics if you're in the engineering sector, but that we don't actually put into practice some very fundamental thoughts in that realm. And so, you know, this made us more and more bold about how we would impose the concepts of ecology on large-scale systems, including infrastructure systems. And sometimes if, you're, if you get a contract that says, fix my flood problem, or fix my water supply protection problem, and it doesn't say, handle this water as the ecological resource that it is with a stewardship focus, um, you're going you're gonna to wind up being able to um, uh, have one system that does one thing, and that, that budget is not going to be spent wisely. With energy, it's the same thing. The military finds themselves spending a huge amount of energy to get energy to the forward operating bases where it operates inherently inefficient diesel generators. And instead of causing the single largest uh, loss of life and source of injury, maybe there's energy at the site. And maybe they could have a different paradigm of tapping that and devising appropriate systems to harvest the energy in different forms that's already there. And maybe when it comes to materials management, it's about um, seeing the inherent energy and materials value, the fact that it's actually near our communities. Some of the other speakers earlier talked about the ability to recycle right in the city, nutrients, cardboard, you name it. And ultimately, sustainability is something that is, it should not just be a buzzword and a hackneyed one at that. It should be something that equates to very specific criteria for any site or project of any scale or any infrastructure system. Water that lands there through precipitation is retained in a pattern that's mimicking nature's original pattern. Soil is not washed away. In fact, it is improving over time. Nutrients are recycled. Contaminants are degraded and assimilated, essentially recycled. Any impacts and benefits are distributed on an equitable socioeconomic basis. Materials are getting reused, and ultimately entropy is minimized, just like an ecosystem does through these linked cycles. But to do this, we certainly need a cultural shift. We actually need to remove administrative concepts like waste. Our entire environmental regulatory program was really designed to prevent certain heinous things from happening. It's not a, a roadmap to doing wise things well. But if we do this, instead of many of our infrastructures costing money, they can become cost avoidance solutions or revenue generating systems. And some other people have asked earlier, how do you handle the scale issues? Well, the site scale with a budget that's in the hands of a client who wants to accomplish objectives A, B, and C, that's where the rubber hits the road. But I don't see that as the enemy. I see that as the source of the solution that allows you to look down at every square meter of land, every cubic volume of soil, every little pore space where the, the alchemy of plants harvesting sunlight, driving biogeochemical cycles, you can do that all at the site scale by being very creative and very interdisciplinary. And when you do it, you accrue all these benefits all the way up to the watershed, region, and planet. So every project is essentially your trusty resource to transact sustainability. I'd like to pause and point out that this is not just something we sit around talking about at the bioengineering group over beers. Although we do that a lot, we think it's part of our secret to success. We actually have gotten the attention from other leaders within government and industry who egg us on to ever more bold and brazen um, leadership directions. And some of these ideas 
take us to redefining infrastructure in a way that is both fundamental to the science foundation that everybody got back in high school, but completely radical in terms of how people normally define infrastructures. We recently partnered with Army researchers to develop a software tool that actually analyzes energy efficiency and, and, and renewable energy selection, not based on the first law of thermodynamics, but actually putting the second law of thermodynamics into practice. And in addition to coming up with some algorithms that analyze the energy merits of different options, we also created a stakeholder engagement tool using the best military minds, and they focus a lot on decision science and the process of making rigorous yet complex decisions in the absence of adequate time and information. So we harvested that military mind and put it to use on this process. And as an end result, we got a chance to be at the table literally writing the policy of Army for their net zero installation definition in which Notice the stealth ecology here. They said they're going to eliminate the concept of waste, synergistically combine outputs of one process to become inputs of others, breaking down all the stovepipes of different departments and disciplines that normally are so disconnected they create their own problems, not just worrying about initial cost, but ultimately about total value, including some non-monetary values. And to map it out further in terms of scale, um, we, we see that you know, we are in a finite planet. This question of resources being finite, it is a reality. And this is all the business we all go about doing. And we ultimately have you know, water, energy, and materials. You could map out other key resources there as well, land, people, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, the name of the game is to, re, you know, to minimize the amount of waste, whether it's solid refuse, greenhouse gases, or any other form of needless inefficiency. And you can't do this until you understand the relationships between the scales. But to build this isn't that hard. We've really cracked the code as designers over the last decade, more than ever before, to come up with smart, efficient buildings. But where the next frontier is, it's really infrastructures that share and distribute energy between buildings, which can often drop your energy demand by half. So you can consume, the buildings can consume half the energy if their infrastructures are more efficient. We're talking about heating and cooling and hot water primarily. Then, if you start looking at other energy resources you have on site, ground source, geothermal, or how about the um, materials and energy that can be harvested from sewage um, and once you start tapping some of these things, you can reduce your energy by um, as much as 90% of current energy needs at the community or military installation scale, and then filling that remaining 10 or 20% of your original energy consumption pattern, doing that with renewables becomes not only feasible, it becomes very cost effective. We've looked, and others have looked at this as well, at the whole nation's energy consumption pattern. And there's huge amounts of inefficiency. To cut to the chase, this is the amount of energy that actually does work. This box is where all the ghost energy goes, all the energy that wasn't really used. It just is lost along the way. And this is because for every amount of energy, let's say the coal going into a coal-burning power plant, only 39% of that gets out into, you know, leaves the power plant, and then you lose more of that in the process of transmission to the end user. And then very often people are putting that into a very inefficient appliance. So there's this innate inefficiency. And if you look at ecosystems, there's always some other piece of the system harvesting that energy back. So we see this as a tr you know, tremendous amount of things that can be put into practice at a national energy policy and, and system scale. Um, all of these things can be mimicked to create huge scale energy systems, not just uh, in terms of a military installation, but in terms of an entire region or the entire nation. Also in terms of matching the energy source with the energy consumption pattern. Um, 
it involves not just, we've heard a lot over the last week of uh, President Obama saying he's the all of the above president, and that's great. But really, the best thing is all of the above combined in the right system, as so there, the waste heat from one system can be collected in another system. And some of these systems have been really defined by some colleagues over at MIT looking at large-scale synergistic energy systems. And at the largest scale, um, you know, there's an opportunity to rid our long-standing nuclear waste problem by, by reprocessing the spent fuel and using, you know, getting rid of that waste problem as it drives synthesis of biofuels and other systems. And, and to do so in a way that involves a pure carbon capture solution, not because there's a new uh, carbon injection system, but because it's built into the infrastructure in the first place. And here's an illustration of one way you do this. So um, in general, the idea is cycles, inspiring people to actually bother to make the linkages to create those cycles and to use every single project to transact restoration. Great, thank you, Wendy. Uh, our next speaker is actually two speakers. Um, Eduardo Rico uh, is trained as a civil engineer. Uh, he works at Arup, and he participates in an architectural collaborative called Ground Lab. Enrique de Labras uh, is trained as an architect uh, with their own architectural practice called DNA Collective. Uh, he teaches at the AA in the Landscape Urbanism Unit uh, um, in London. Uh, she is completing doctoral studies at the London School of Economics. Together they practice and teach um, under the, the name or rubric of relational urbanism. Uh, they've taught at the Berlaga, and we've had the pleasure of having them for two years running now um, teach a spring workshop with the Core for uh, Landscape Architecture uh, Studio. Um, in their work, they talk of cities as the territorialization of processes, interdependencies, and relations informed by different decision-making bodies, design teams, and other agents in a constant process of negotiation. Uh, Eduardo Rico and Enriqueta Labras. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction of the work of relational urbanists, and Eduardo will continue explaining our experience in in Arnavutkoi. Um, in the context of uh, new communication technologies and the reconfiguration of, um, of the new production systems, I would like to open the floor with the work of Florida. Florida, this, this work is from the Center of International Earth Science Information Network from the University of Columbia. Here, Florida, what he did was to measure the spatial concentration of a population, light emissions, but not only the use of energy, but the production of knowledge, patents, and scientific citations. In, he, in his conclusion, what he ended up arising was that the war is not flat at all, but it's really a spiking. And uh, if we try to understand what are the peaks of these spikes, it's really our global cities. And the reason why I raised this figure is because I want to raise a topic that has been raised during the day, but from another different perspective, is the, the topic of a scale. And the scale, I want to, of course, put it as a physical metric perspective, uh, in the way that now city regions, the size of the city regions 
have challenged the way we understand urban, urban design and geography. Somehow ecological systems are inside of our city regions. But another perspective that is important and is challenging the solutions for that is the, the scale of the institutions and how the evolution as a phenomenon of governments have some, somewhat uh, challenged uh, the solutions uh, for these big scale problems. Uh, the evolution, uh, we understand by the evolution as uh, the evolution of power and resources from national governments to local governments in order to deal with problems of uh, employment, uh, of, um, of env environment, and also local economic development. The evolution is place specific and uh, somehow it depends on the legitimacy of the different government ties in the specific place. So if I have to underpin the three main topics that in relational urbanism um, we somehow try to bring, it is the, the, the question of a scale, but in relation to the ecological processes and with respect of the different relations among the different government tires. In that sense, um, we have a long-term research agenda where we try to where we try to understand how new design technologies help us to think about methodologies that systemically engage with these processes and relations. And um, two theoretical um, underpinnings for the relational models. First, a reminder of um, the Christopher Alexander critique in the 1970s. Um, and basically, the criticism of the tree-like linear systems that, that most of the planning um, uh, projects were having at this age. We bring this criticism and we, we also merge it with the, another uh, very interesting theoretical uh, framework that was developed by, um, by Alexander Codd in the same period, which is basically the theory of uh, relational models for database systems. In, the, in his theory, he highlighted that when you have an independent indexing, then the relational model is a time-varying set of relations. So our we use the digital tools in a way that each index, each element of the system remains independent and the relational model comes at a specific moment in time and tries to deal with a specific and tight, and tight agenda. So I'm going to introduce uh, the work uh, we have done in Arnabutkoi and other colleagues are going to, to show their work in this city. Uh, and you will see how this is put into practice. Okay, Arnavut Koi, um, is, it is uh, the gray area that you see uh, in the map. Uh, it is a, a municip it is a province uh, newly formed uh, in early, 2000 is supposed to be part of the green belt uh, of, of the city and actually 90% uh, of, of its land is declared water land and, and managed by Iski Authority. The contradiction for that is that actually Arnavut Koi is currently accommodating a demographic explosion. Its population grew in 2005 by 
In the context of the master plan, uh, Arnavut Koi uh, from, the, from Istanbul uh, Metropolitan Agency, Arnavut Koi supposed to remain as a green belt part of the city, but then there was this launch from the central government of Ankara in order to build the third bridge over the Bosphorus. Of course, this um, somehow collapsed and also put into question one of the main constraints that Arnavutkoi has. So, I don't know how. Yeah, uh, let me see. Well, I don't know if. Okay, so Arnavutko is basically placing here. Uh, as you can see in the map, Arnavutko is set in the main water catchment areas of Istanbul. So in order to understand systemically or uh, a first a systemic approach towards the, the, the problem, we found uh, the theoretical underpinnings of the new economic geography. Uh, this discipline basically tries to disentangle what are the forces that drive firms and people to a specific, um, a specific location. So somehow the city emerges uh, as a result of agglomeration and dispersion forces. So in that sense, uh, we construct uh, some sort of simple agglomeration and dispersion forces model where we saw the south and uh, show how the infrastructure investment in the 80s uh, somehow pulled firms to settle in this, in this um, stage in the city. So you have... Um, then other agglomeration forces that somehow is driving urbanization towards the north. One of, of these uh, is the, the risk of uh, earthquake that is, is decreasing as you move northwards. The other is, of course, the congestion of the south and uh, the increase in land value. So this is somehow uh, to put into context that actually uh, what is happening in Arnavutkoi, it's strongly linked to these two industrial clusters. This first, which is, uh, it, it was planned in the 80s, and this second cluster, which is unplanned and is informally growing northwards. So, as a first proposal, uh, when we were asked to engage with Arnavut Koi here in the center, we proposed a more systemic approach to the future of Arnavut Koi, in a sense that the future of Arnavut Koi will pass how the different systems will challenge the two industrial clusters this one that was facing gentrification, this one that somehow kept growing but in an informal manner and challenging the ecological systems in the territory. Then you had this area which was highly protected by ISKI and as a result suffering economic decline. So all these areas in the territory somehow influence one another. So the project mainly wanted to construct a systemic agenda where the different water catchments were put in context with also the provision of infrastructure and what is more important, the multi-level of governance. And in here I want to hi highlight that um, environmental project, uh, environmental problems and are transboundary. It, it means that uh, sometimes the problems are problems of the, the divisions that the different tires uh, have and that also suffer displacement. When you want to tackle certain environmental problem, 
you tackle at the level of the firm, you can tackle at the level of the, of the individual, or of the system, but sometimes you solve it in detriment of creating another environmental problem. So here we build a relational model with Aru. Yeah, and in a way, what this is, what we try to show is this was the current status where most of the, of the uh, current developments were throwing the wastewater into the lakes, these three lakes that were completely dirty. Our proposal was somehow manage the nutrients within at least the top sites such that you would throw less nutrients and probably allowing you to build more housing than the one that it was initially envisaged by the master plan. That was being quite restrictive and that was being uh, quite of a big problem for the North of Arnaudkoi. We did build up a model that has this left uh, interface where you can control massing, get an understanding of the main variables, whether it's the transportation or the traffic, shown with the colors on the lines, or the amount of water that actually were the two main, I would say, limitations uh, for, for the master plan. Surprisingly, it was water. It's normally not the case, but in this case, it was. And it's one of the big matters for the, uh, for the site. We had five sites. There were five student groups doing research in each of them. And we are going to show you uh, two of those uh, of those sites, of those examples. The first one is one of the industrial sites here towards the towards the left. Uh, it was placed in an area in a valley that was already substantially polluted, so it was a certain idea of let's try not to pollute the valleys which are slightly cleaner. That's a bit of uh, the condition that they were worried with. It's the old areas or the old villages which have grown, uh, where immigration and uh, where, where key works, uh, workers of the industry live, and uh, that have the capacity of uh, hosting quite a lot of economic activities which are somehow subcontracted from the big industry. So in a way, fabric, urban fabric there hosts quite a lot of activities which help maintain those guys with work as, as a source of like an extra source of income. That's, that's quite important since the government is also thinking of moving some of the industries away and somehow leaving these guys, these guys out of employment. That's the way the landscape would look like, a bit sort of like a open fields with every now and then monumentalistic and horrendous uh, developments, uh, mostly state driven, but only God knows if it's true. Uh, that's the way they started to work, trying to understand how the topography was coming down to this ravine. They did a study of contour lines, plot sizes, different areas of the meshes, and they studied maximum and minimum plot sizes to come up with the first idea of potential plots of how to work on the valley. Next idea was how do we put together those ecologies of uses, whether they were ranging from local uh, agriculture, that would be in a way, or to foster local economics of, of, of those guys living there, industry, and some sort of like subcontracted and some sort of a smaller scale residential that could be developed by those guys or by the local guys, not just the big money. So there was an idea of how to build up all those relationships in a typology, variations of that typology, and they fabricated what we call a relational model. That's the site. You don't see there, but I swear there's a mesh there of, of where are, which are the plots which have a, an abstract a representation of, a, of uses. So the student could play with densities of uses on this side, trying to explore how different densities and what is the spatial implication of different densities and different quantities on the site. So it was quite easy, in a way, to play around with the impact of the ravines and how much do you want to offset and how do you want to offset from the ravines or ecologically sensitive areas, okay, to then pick one of them and study more in detail how would you introduce a bit more agriculture to the top right. So there was a further level of exploration. So these are the results of the relational model, how they can play with massing and how they can start opening up a discussion on how special, uh, I would say, definitions and typological definitions of the city happen in a collective manner, what is a lot, what is not enough, what's the amount, what's the right type of special quantity. 
while you at simultaneously understand other types of, uh, of variables, such as in this case, water and the amount of residential for those guys. That was the layout. This was a second tier model, like the model was more detailed than the initial one. This model would take much longer to run, so that's why it was run only once. That was the sort of like corridors of intense urban development, agricultural corridors on the sides. Okay, those were the layers coming out of the model that in a way would be telling you how much of each staff would you have. And that was the sort of like a, a zebra type development of uh, urbanistical, I would say, or architectural urbanism. The next project will show very quickly, instead of being, I would say, uh, architectural urbanism, it's more urbanistical architecture, it's probably smaller scale, trying to deal with the disjunction of middle class obsession with gated communities and the mess they had with the water around the centers of Arnaudkoi. So in this case, there was a much stronger approach towards gating nature and fabricating a new type of nature within certain areas that was uh, accessible to the public, straightforwardly to the public. So the idea was starting again with the indexing and the drawing of how the topography works. Yes, one second. Uh, they would fabricate these sort of pockets of, of nature around these walls and fabricate an idea of how these uh, pockets were treating the water, providing infrastructure, and then different types of housing, some of which were liable or sort of like related to local populations. So they fabricated a model that would enable them to understand quantities and relationships between locals and big money, which was the bigger wall, okay? So that's the sort of like overall result we'll be getting in the large scale. Thank you very much. Great, thank you both. All right. Our next speaker is uh, Christophe Giraud. Uh, Christophe is full professor and chair at the landscape in landscape architecture at the Department of Architecture of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, ETH Zurich, uh, where he directs the Institute of Landscape Architecture and the Landscape Visualization and Modeling Lab and is part of the ETH Future Cities Laboratory uh, in Singapore. He practices as well um, as a landscape architect primarily. Um, focuses on large-scale projects involving dynamic topographic landscape modeling, uh, issues of technology and landscape, and questions of the cultural imagination. Christoph has a double master's in architecture and in landscape architecture uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he's taught here at the GSD at the Royal School of Fine Arts in Copenhagen, the Institute of Urban Design in Stuttgart, in Barcelona, in Versailles, um, and other places. It's a pleasure to welcome back uh, to the GSD, Christophe Giraud. Just a second before we, we set up. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. <clears throat> Oops. Okay. So I'm not sure that this presentation is going to fit in this particular module. Uh, but I, what I want to present to you today is uh, <clears throat> an inspiring case of, uh, of case studies that we've been working on in Zurich using uh, particular tools. Uh, this is part of a research project that has been financed by the uh, Swiss Science Foundation, uh, the SNF, uh, where we've been given uh, equipment that is usually only given to engineers, to Army Corps of Engineers. And, uh, what we explained to them is that we basically said that we'd be the only institute in Europe with this kind of technology. It's called point cloud technology. Uh, and we were granted um, um, half a million Swiss francs to buy this piece of equipment and to play around with it uh, in the Alps. Um, so we're actually a little bit more pretentious and less defensive. We're saying that we could probably not really use the tools that engineers use, but we could actually show them how to use them differently 
than they currently do. Uh, I'm showing a very particular case study. It's the case study of the Gotthard Pass in Switzerland, which is in terms of history of palimpsest, of, uh, of uh, topography, of engineering, an extraordinary crucible. Uh, and the tools that we've been developing are in a way questioning the basis uh, of all the planning tools that at least I've learned to use in my education. We've had these discussions with Charles a few times. Um, in a way, what I'm going to try to introduce pretentiously today is, is the sort of uh, no return, the introduction of the third dimension, probably even the fourth dimension, as a basic tool of design and of operation. And if not uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, siding of mapping, at least the, the, the placing of mapping in, uh, yeah, in a lesser case, in a lesser case of, of definition. So let me just do a little bit of history because I was also asked by Pierre to be a slight historian. Uh, so I'm going to go for sort of the typical case. For most people in Switzerland, uh, the English Alpine Club, and more particularly uh, Ruskin and all, the whole Lakist approach to nature, has marked our understanding, our vision of nature in a sort of indelible way. Here, if you read the Ruskin quote, the greatest things a human soul ever does in this world is to see something and tell what it saw in a plain way. Hundreds of people can talk for one who can think, but thousands can think for one who can see. To see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. John Ruskin. I'm not necessarily an advocate of that, and I believe, unfortunately, that at the end of this very short talk, you'll never look at the Alps in this way again, <laughs> and you will never believe what has just been read to you. I'm sorry about that for all sensitive Ruskinites and Mauritians in this room. Edward Imhoff, probably the greatest Swiss cartographer, uh, and I'll show the sort of graphic convention that he developed, despite the fact that he was a cartographer and that he knew that what he was doing was flattening 3,500 meters of relief on a piece of paper, which is not an easy thing to do or to render acceptable. He also knew, looking at the same sites twice, but from a different point of view, that the, the, the perception of that site would be completely different. For instance, the density of a forest, depending on whether you were lying low in the valley or high up on a rock, was perceived completely differently, etc., etc. He also started developing what I call relief topography, I mean, a sort of coding that we've all thoroughly learned, either as Boy Scouts or as uh, 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 students of environmental design. Uh, we all take that for granted but he is one of the, the, the forefathers of all these sort of hiking maps that we love to have on our, on our way into nature. They're literally part of that communication of nature. But what Imhoff knew what he was also doing was taking the Albertian system of orthographic projection, flattening what he saw outside on a picture plane, and eventually generating a physical model from below. I mean, that kind of complicated process is the basis of all the planning convention, all the mapping that I've seen today, all of that is part of this very elaborate code that has been put in place in the Western world since Albertian perspective, in the Renaissance. I mean, it is a direct product of that, our understanding of nature, our communication of nature, our design tools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Imhoff. Imhoff even projected projects on that, like very simple things, like you put a retention dam and you paint in blue whatever get fills up. In a way, what he was doing was not just rendering, he was actually using these cartographic tools as tools of engineering, of, of projection, and that too is something that we have completely accepted as a method. Even his contour lines, contour lines started from, from the marine tradition. You had to fathom the depths of the water with a pole and you had to map out the, 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 the depths of a harbor or of a coast in order not to wreck your ship. This transfer of the contour line onto relief, onto 
topography came only in the 19th century, and we have learned to accept that too. We even have people obsessed. I mean, I did grading and drainage in my time with pencils and eraser, a lot of eraser, and I can tell you, you could only be a real landscape architect if you knew how to draw these parallel lines. That's what it was, that and also magic markers, right? We have all digested this and finally accepted this byproduct, which is what I call a graphic convention. Beautiful, we always find that beautiful. And it reminds me a lot of the remark that was uh, said yesterday uh, by, by Rania about this crumpled handkerchief. Basically, what we have learned to accept as a tool of representation or illusion of space is the crumpled handkerchief, the perfect cartographic map with all the height lines. And here what I find extraordinary in these, in these documents is that infrastructure, which is very heavily drawn into it, looks ideal. It is very far from the reality that you actually perceive when, as a human being, you go there to visit, for instance, as a tourist, right? So what are we going to do about all this? I mean, I'm not here to create a sort of graphic revolution, but I'm saying that the tools of the 21st century are going to radically change the way we operate in our environment. This is our little core team at the ETH. This is Pascal Werner, Ilmar Herxen, and James Melson that have been sort of in the war room here. They're actually pointing at a, a relief model that we did with a roughly two million facets of the Gotthard. It's actually a CNC milled model on which we project Landsat photos. And they have been co concocting together, and I'm not going to go into the technical details of that because I assume that the GSD in America are way ahead of us in this game, so I'm just going to show you the product, and then we'll discuss the applications of the product. If you look at this sort of graphic, it looks very anodyne. Uh, you can believe me, I'm explaining to you that these are point clouds representing the Gothard Pass, and, and you can say, well, okay, what is this fuzz? It looks a bit like a an aerosol spray with a bit of white and green and gray, and you're showing me a section of some sort of pipe underneath the gutter that is actually the longest tunnel in the world, 57.4 kilometers to be precise. But actually these points are all geographically positioned. They're points of information. And if I explain to you that the degree of information that we've gathered here is roughly 10, well, five to 10,000 points per square meter of information, then you start realizing that something is going on. <clears throat> Before I go into this technical explanation, there's a diagram that I'd like you all to look at. The top left-hand diagram shows the Alps at the time when all the, the Grand Tour artists would go over the, the Gotthard. It would take them two weeks to go over the Gotthard. It was a grueling trip. Some of them did watercolors and paintings, others barely survived. Then came the lo steam locomotive, which is the diagram directly underneath on the left-hand side, where the first segments of tunnels appeared. In other words, what you see in gray is what landscape disappears from the eye, right, as you're traveling. Then came the motorway on the top right, and now on the bottom right is the high-speed tunnel. You cross the Gotthard in less than 15 minutes, at 250 kilometers an hour on a flat pipe, and you miss a little bit of the landscape. The landscape you miss <laughs> is shown in gray. This is, we're actually crossing the Gotthard without a landscape here. And uh, we are walking in that tunnel, and that's today's reality. Uh, take it or leave it. Um, I think this is uh, having huge implications on the way we're gonna understand our relationship to the environment and our relationship basically to sort of uh, a landscape and its, and, its, and its significance in society. Therefore, when Turner painted the Devil's Bridge, and I believe here we're right above Devil's Bridge, you can't tell, but it's almost the same uh, <laughs> latitude. He was a visionary. I mean, I've always been a real fan of Turner. He was a visionary because in a way this sort of gaseous, liquefaction of the mountain. You can't really tell what is cloud, what is light, what is rock, what is human, what is natural, what is water, what is vegetation. Everything is sort of fusing in a sort of pixelated uh, sort of impression. He was actually a forerunner of the extraordinary vision that I'm going to show you now, which is this point cloud vision. It's basically 
a three-dimensional electronic model of this whole region that we've been carefully mapping thanks to uh, a research program that we, we're actually developing together with Mendrisio and with, uh, with uh, Burkhalte Sumi Architects as part of a research uh, grant. This is the overhead view of what we call the Devil's Bridge. This is actually already the view of that point cloud model. The Devil's Bridge is over to the far, uh, to the middle, middle left of your view. And this is entering the model. We're going through the membrane of the, of the mountain, and we're sort of wandering in this space where you have to realize that in this picture, it's not a film, within this picture, every pixel is hanging on seven satellites. It's actually a really a model, a physical model of the environment showing rock face and every minute detail. We're very, very far from the Imhof reduction, the Imhof contour line. You see here, for instance, the entire scanning that we've done. We're crossing the entire Gotthard Pass. We've mapped that. And basically, what you get are these pictures. Now, you can use it as a sort of photographic collection. And here, you have to understand that all these uh, uh, points of information, for instance, every point that you see on the road or along the way, every bit of grass could be inventoried. You could, you could actually get the calibration on each tree trunk that appears on the far left. I mean, it's an extremely powerful tool of analysis and planning. It's not just a picture, it's a model. This is the other end of the whole spectrum. We're in Bodio. Right now, we've jumped those 57.4 kilometers. We're at the other end of that long tunnel you just saw. And again, you get this extraordinary amount of information. Millimeter, you can tell any bump on the road. Even a cigarette butt would appear with contour lines around it. Uh, the machines we have have a range of about a kilometer and a half, and we use a mix of terrestrial, mobile, and aerial scanning techniques. And now I'm going to take you on short journeys through the model. I hope we don't have an accident here. We're going right through the portal. That's the north portal of that tunnel you just saw there. And now we're arriving on a place called Gershenen. And what I find interesting with Gershenen is right now I'm going to show you, and this is really where the demonstration becomes interesting. Um, Hashim Sarkis yesterday talked about ground, about contact with ground. I thought it was a very important remark. He talked about the visible and the invisible. What you're seeing here, you still believe here in this room that you're looking at a movie of a picture. But what I'm going to show you is this is actually an electronic cake, and we can actually cut through Gershenen. We can cut slices through Gershenen and get extremely precise to topical information on that site. So let me try and make my point clear. Here, we're going to start cutting. We're cutting right through the city, and we're, getting, we're registering every point of the infrastructure, the bed of the river. You could cut 100 times salami through Gershenem. We just cut salami once. But then you can get the other side of that cut. It's reappearing here. And that's the other side of that cut. You even see into the infrastructure of the roads. These are the covered motorways. You are reading through the entire infrastructural tripes of the little village. Gushinen is the last village before the Gotthard Tunnel. So it's a beautiful image, but it is also something you can translate into pure topographic information. You can get data on any square meter of this village. We even took the architect's wife, Marianne Burkata, her mother lives in one of those houses. We took the architect into the kitchen and had him look out the window. He freaked out, of course. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a bedeviled, it's a bedeviled tool. It's really a bedeviled tool of engineering and we're happy to have inherited it. Same thing here. This is an impossible view. We're entering uh, the Gushinen sort of maelstrom of infrastructure, train, motorway, national road, you name it, and we're flying in there. Any plane or helicopter would crash here. We're flying in there like a, like a, a dragonfly or a butterfly, right? We're just flying through this stuff. We're just taking a look at this entire thing. Here, too, we could cut sections through all these things and get 
within a three millimeter range the exact elevational uh, uh, location of each point. It's, it's, uh, it's a military tool. We could uh, sell this to a lot of agencies, right? And then we head back, as in a film, but you, you use this as a model. And what we are saying is, in the future, every city, every village is going to have a model like this. And uh, people are going to design with this. You can actually go back and actually do a variety of, of works, essays. You can compile a whole bunch of information. These are the degrees of precision. I'm not showing you the elevational information there. But what you can do here, for instance, here we crack Gushinen like a nut in two. It's just to show you what we're doing. We're sort of splitting this thing open, showing you the information. It is no longer an image. It's no longer just a plan. It's no longer mapping. And actually, the training that you need for that is 3D training. And I'm struggling with that myself because I was never trained as a 3D trainer. So we're going to have to do push-ups in 3D thinking, right? <clears throat> Let's take you up the Gotthard now. We're going to shoot up. We're just going up to the Devil's Bridge now. So we've gone past Gushenen. The tunnel is already running underneath. And this is the model. This is the extent of this model that you see. We're just traveling right through it. Look at the infrastructure. Look at the reading. You can s stop at any moment in time. And I could derive a thousand sections along this road. I could cut through every segment of the road. Each column on the motorway is positioned, right? And here we're arriving slowly with this incredible infrastructural sort of intestine there, uh, going all the way up to the Devil's Bridge. And this is one of the parts I prefer. This is where you clearly see that you can easily just, and Imhof would have a heart attack, you can just fly into the rock face and it becomes a curtain. There you go. You're behind the rock face. Do you see that? Let me show it to you again. <laughs> here you go. You're going behind the membrane here. OK. And then you get to the Devil's Bridge, right? Going through the rock face again. So what's really interesting here is it's no longer material. It's really just points of information, points of very highly precise information. And we're going to finally arrive up to the Gotthard Dam, and that's where I'm going to do my little demo if I don't totally flip out on this. The other thing I find very interesting here is you have the palimpsest of a very old Roman road. This is the old Roman road here. And the newer road on the other side. You can really start reading things in a variety of ways. So this is the Lucinda Dam on the top. And we're going to use that dam just to show you how you can take an existing object, modify it, draw a section through it, uh, and then we'll show you even the sort of Imhofian graphic convention. Here we go. We just cut the dam. We show the bottom of the dam with the different depth levels. This is actually a hollow structured dam, concrete dam. You can cut any section you want through that object. That object. You can actually differentiate it and have it appear uh, for any kind of design purpose, you could add on a layer, make it higher, modify it. Any kind of design could be embedded in this model. And just to show you how poor the Imhofian school is, we just applied for the fun of it some contours here, right? This would be what we're used to. This is the contour we are accustomed to today. So I really think that we're onto something here. Uh, uh, as, as, far as, a, as far as a design tool is concerned. This is, again, this view, you know, the old Roman road, the, the newer road to the pass. Here we're on the top of the, this is what the Swiss defend. You know, they have the army on both sides, and this is, they're defending this desolate valley on top. There's nothing there, but the cannons are pointing in both directions, north and south. Uh, I shouldn't make fun of that. Um, Again, you can look at the infrastructure. You look, can look through the infrastructure. This is actually not a mistake. This is actually a, a spillover point here. That's why it's slightly lower. The elevational precision is incredible. That is something where we can work one-to-one -one with engineers. I've been using that. With, we've been working with this tool on river projects in Switzerland. We even worked also <coughs> in uh, Holland on the region of Dordrecht. I didn't want to bring this today 
but these <coughs> incredible levels of precision, we can work within a range of five centimeters <coughs> elevational precision, which makes us incredibly credible vis-a-vis -vis engineers. We can work on as many sections as they want. We usually provide them with the material. <coughs> Same thing here, you can cut through a dam in a very quick way. And I'm just showing you that just as a tool. You can make it into a positive image. You just cut whatever you want through the landscape. And you have to understand it's not image-based. It is geographically positioned information. And the big revolution, because it was a problem until recently with the mesh. You couldn't bring your design onto a GIS mesh. But the point cloud system is just a field of points. And you can just embed any kind of design, mo design modification, whether it's an impression or an addition, onto that basis. And that really is a conceptual revolution, as far as I'm concerned. What I really like is how the, the mountain gets sort of cut up in the far left corner there. So in terms of degrees of precision, what I find also very interesting with this tool of point clouds, here we're in the sort of hostel of the past, where for centuries people would just be lucky to get there alive when they were passing the, the hill. What I find extraordinary when you look at this model, this is part of that overall model we've been looking at, um, it's an infrastructural mess, you know? It's just incredible when you look at it very carefully. This is the other side, the south side of the Alps. Again, with these sections of Airolo, I'm just showing you exactly the same thing we did in Gershnen. You can just cut through all the infrastructure. And as you cut, there's a sort of invisible glass plane here you get all the infrastructures registering at different heights, including the, the watershed, which is running right below. And it's not by chance that that's the lowest point in the picture, right? Same thing looking the other way. This is the, 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 the other side of the same thing, where you just cut through the entire system all the way up into the cow meadows. This is really uh, a, an extraordinary uh, sort of progress based on, on what we had. And what I find interesting with this deployment of tools is you can send a group of students there for a day and they come back with that data. I and mean, it's not like something you have to order for three years and, and get permission for. Everything is fairly low, low tech or low permission, at least, in terms of, of possible use. Then I want to show you, as a last part of this presentation, these incredible sections of the Tremola. Tremola is the most famous of these uh, uh, Swiss roads, these Swiss Alpine roads going down to Italy. Uh, this is the new road cutting into the mountain. And it's going to be a sort of demonstration of how the infrastructure really reads. Uh, in a way, I'm going to take you into the blackness of the mountain. It's going to look very comfortable. But we're just going to follow this road a bit. And you're going to see very quickly that the road becomes a sort of tunnel and that in a way, you don't see anything anymore because you're basically, well, you're sort of absorbed by this, this, this material. You see the mountains in front of you. Everything here is, is a physical model of an existing situation. And then I'm taking you back to the old road and we're gonna fly you down safely to, um, to the um, Italian side of the Swiss Alps sort of gliding down. We're going to bring you all the way back down to road level. But as I can say, you can go to any side of this model. You can look at every rock, every tree. I mean, it's just an extraordinary amount of data. And in a way, what I want to try and end my, my presentation on today is to basically say that with this sort of point cloud revolution or the, this degrees of precision, that in a way, I don't want to quote Lou Kahn, or Mies, I don't know who it is, I just want to say that God is in the data, right? <laughs> uh, and I, I think that uh, uh, for this purpose alone, the fact that you can work your way in and out of the skin of a mountain, that you can really work on very clear positioning systems, like just look at this view, this is an impossible view. This would be a, a view taken by an eagle just coming above. I mean. We're, going, we're entering very rapidly into a sort of conceptual revolution that is necessarily going to affect the way we think space and we design space. I thank you for your attention.
<laughs> Very good. Thank you. Charles, can we get one of those? Uh, we're halfway there. Uh, feel free to stretch a little bit if you, if you want to. Uh, our next uh, pair of speakers uh, is from um, SW SWA Group, uh, Kevin Shanley, CEO of SWA in Houston, Yingyu Hung, Managing Principal of SWA in Los Angeles. Kevin, interestingly enough, is uh, chairman of the board and past president of the Houston Bayou Preservation Association, where he seeks to transform and model how we can optimally relate to streams and watersheds uh, within the urban fabric. Um, I'm told he promotes a regenerative vision for how to build and improve drainage systems, how to create public policy that uh, can transform our urban environments into healthful and sustainable places. Ying Yu uh, is also a lecturer at the University of Southern California. Uh, at SWA, she's created the Infrastructure Research Initiative to document, catalog, and disseminate the latent ecological and recreational value of infrastructure uh, in cities and towns, looking at various case studies, including Houston, Los Angeles, and others. It's a pleasure to have both Kevin and Ying Yu here. Thanks. This is going to be kind of two parts. And the first part's going to be kind of a rapid ride down the rabbit hole of the application of thinking about infrastructure and trying to influence public policy and infrastructure in uh, the Houston region. Um, I like to think about scale. At what, you know, what scale is applicable to the issues we're dealing with? I'd probably say no, but maybe here, we're in the Gulf Coast region down in Houston, we're in the path of major uh, tropical events. The landscape is definitely an issue, the scale. Uh, the scale of the ground surface down at that sort of uh, mycological scale uh, is also actually important at a certain point. And most importantly is the scale of the brain. Uh, we've been talking a lot about ideas of infrastructure, and I'd like to ask you to think about the term called meme. A meme is an idea that uh, cognitive scientists are beginning to create a, a, uh, a theory of knowledge that describes an idea and the life of the idea as it evolves in our community. And I, I wonder at the strength and the meaningfulness of the word infrastructure. That's been asked before. Um, so here we're trying to apply it. And I like to think of infrastructure as the bones of what makes our culture possible. Uh, and then we flesh it out with all the soft stuff that we are. Uh, roads we kind of know about, uh, sewer, water systems. But our educational system is also part of our infrastructure. Our Arts and our culture is part of our infrastructure. And as I've learned very much to my chagrin, our legal system and our legislative process is a big part of what shapes uh, we can do in the landscape. Um, in our region, as I mentioned, we get lots of big storms. Hundreds of these storms come in. Uh, this is a satellite photograph of the Houston Metroplex. Uh, we're about the third largest metropolitan area. I wish we were more like a crinkled handkerchief. Uh, we're more like a very smoothed out handkerchief. It's very flat here. We sit on several thousand feet of mud. Um, but we have a very complex hydrology. And um, I got into this thing. Rivers have always been my hobby. Water has been my hobby. I moved to Houston about 30 years ago. Um, and Houston is a is the uh, third or second worst repetitive flood claim damage community in the whole country. And I'll only give you one guess to who's worse than we are. Um, it rains a lot. The highest recorded rainfall ever recorded in North America um, was just on the south side of that picture. In Pearland, it rained uh, about 42 inches, three and a half feet in 24 hours. So we get rain a lot. And because of that, the Corps of Engineers has been active there. We've, the community has begged them to come, and uh, they've created a lot of uh, changes to our urban fabric. And I've always tried to educate people that you've got to think about the watershed. You can't go, if you're interested in the rivers and protecting the rivers, you've got to think about the watershed. 
Um, this is actually a stream bed in the southern part. This is the south boundary of the uh, Harris County area. There's a stream running through there. This is what I call slow water. Um, you can see ponding up in the corner. It's rained here not too long ago. And it might take a couple of days or even weeks for water to reach that stream. Uh, in an urban landscape, the water hits the roof, hits the parking lot. It's collected into a collection system in minutes or even seconds. If there's water in that parking lot about 15 minutes after a rain, the property manager is calling the plumber, the engineer is saying, get rid of this water. Um, it's a problem. It creates nuisance flooding, but more significantly, it creates significant uh, structural flooding. It's a big, big problem in our area. Uh, in 2001, a storm came through and flooded 75,000 homes in the Houston area and hundreds of thousands of cars, knocked out the Houston Medical Center. Uh, major infrastructure challenge. And how did we get there? Well, we collect the water in piping systems. We run it down to small ditches. Small ditches go into big ditches. And the result of it is a radical change to what's called the time of concentration. And urban designers should know this term uh, if you're going to know anything about hydrology. The red line is, this is for one of the bayous that runs through uh, downtown Houston, right near Rice University in the medical center called Bray's Bayou. The red line is the, the influence in the bayou of a storm. Uh, the, you, those are hours down the bottom. The vertical axis is the amount of water in the storm. The blue line is what happens now, in sort of roughly the year 2000. The red line was sort of 1915. It's the same amount of water. It's the same rainfall. It's the same storm in that watershed. And during, because of urbanization and fast water, we've Thinking of stormwater as something bad, we've got to get rid of it, we shove it down to the bayou, it's this massive traffic jam in the stream bed, and the solutions to it are not good. This is a different way of looking at the data from the 30s to the 200s, the, the blue dots are the highest storm recorded in that, uh, highest rainfall in that channel at any given time during those years. You can see the trend line as that watershed has been urbanized. This is a bayou uh, just a few hundred feet from where I live, White Oak Bayou. Uh, circa 1950s, but this is what it looks like today. This thing moves a whole lot more water, a whole lot faster. It removed thousands of homes from the floodplain. You remember the flooded hoses I showed? My house went under four and a half feet of water um, in 2001. This, though, is what this stream bed is the kind of vision that we have that we'd like our other bayous to be. Let's move forward. Uh, so the problem is fast water. The solution is slow water. We as urban designers ought to be thinking about creating a sponge. There's lots and lots of ways to do that. Uh, there's no single solution that makes it all work. But if you do all those little things, you could protect an urban area like Houston. And you could store just a little bit of, you could take half the 100-year storm and store it. Or you could, if you did everything in the high range, you could basically store more than the 100-year storm and basically get rid of the flooding issue. So there are big things the government does, uh, regional basins. This is 20,000 acres that can store a vast amount of water when it rains. Uh, we're now, we don't have that kind of real estate, so we've got to find smaller areas, um, hundreds of acres at a time, dig them out to store water. These things uh, become beautiful parks for a growing urban population. Uh, they store the water between events. They're great recreational areas. They store, provide uh, very important wildlife habitat. Um, some of these things, this is under construction. It's a mile long from sort of left to right and half a mile from north to south. Uh, it's not even finished construction, but already the birds, the migratory birds were in one of the flyways too, sort of like the Mississippi, uh, have discovered it. We're doing these, applying these things elsewhere to where we go. This is in Guangzhou, near Guangzhou. Uh, this is part of their drainage infrastructure. And we said, well, gee, let's use some of these principles. Let's get people to think about drainage as providing more than just one solution. We don't have the money anymore to do things, projects that are just single purpose infrastructure. It should be providing, if you, if you spend a million dollars on drainage, you ought to be providing uh, habitat, water quality benefits, urban wildlife habitat, um, and all kinds of things. This is a, a real estate project uh, near Hong Kong where the water Basically, the drainage system multiplied the value of the real estate. Uh, Buffalo Bayou is, a, is one of the streams that runs right through Houston. It's been much publicized, and it's been made possible only because of the thinking about the bigger watershed. Uh, this is its 
uh, representation downtown as sort of a master plan. This is what it looked like just a few years ago. It was forgotten, like many urban waterways. Uh, it was a piece of open land where you could dump transportation infrastructure on top of it by rethinking it, rethinking about the, the multiple purposes that a drainage corridor could solve. This is infrastructure, but allowing it to serve multiple benefits. In this case, it's recreation and habitat in, a, in the central core of the city. Um, it, we've now got all kinds of things happening, waterways. Uh, there's an, a nonprofit group that organizes boat races, uh, movies, and all kinds of things down on this corridor. Uh, the transformation of our infrastructure, uh, this is uh, one of the major thoroughfares, sort of 1950. This is what it looks like today. So guess what? When it rains, all this stuff runs down into the stream beds, and we've got to figure out a way to do it. The rivers are changing in result of the change in time of concentration. Rivers exist in a state of dynamic equilibrium with their watershed. This, all of our urban rivers are way out of equilibrium, so we've got to be thinking about how we're going to solve the problems of turbidity, bacteria content, in a city that's still a very young city. We're about 175 years old. Uh, we're going to add the city of the population of Los Angeles to our area in the next generation. And how are we going to do it? Do we have the same old solutions? We don't have enough money in the federal budget to do, to solve the problems with single purpose infrastructure. What we've got to be doing is finding ways to do it as multiple solutions. And our infrastructure really is our culture. It's a reflection of who we are. My mother's Dutch. You know, you go to Holland and experiencing their drainage infrastructure is a part of experiencing Dutch culture. And so as we build our infrastructure, I'm passionate about water, but there's many other kinds of infrastructure. You ought to be thinking and communicating to our policymakers and to your engineering colleagues, your design colleagues, that by gosh, that infrastructure represents who you are and who they are as well. So my colleague, Ying Yu Hung, talks about uh, the application of this in Los Angeles and elsewhere. Yeah, um, since we're two of us trying to cover a lot of stuff in 20 minutes, um, so I'm, ju I'm just going to try to um, go through this as fast as possible. Um, through Kevin's presentation and the various examples of watersheds as infrastructure, it is necessary to point out that because, S because of SWA's global practice, the firm has an immense interest and ability to explore and analyze the state of infrastructure around the world. At the same time, we are very much embedded in local projects within our respective cities where we practice. The challenges of urban watersheds in Los Angeles are unique to the city. However, lessons le um, learned from Houston may provide a point of reference for what could be done in LA. Um, Los Angeles is a metropolis of progress and mobility made possible by the advancement of infrastructure system. It is undisputable that highways have contributed greatly to the econ economic progress of the region, a county of 9.8 million people and rising. Only 14.6% of Angelinos um, live within a quarter mile of accessible open space. As ma the majority of infrastructure in Los Angeles was built in the post-war era designed for singular functions, one cannot help but to question whether these systems fulfill today's needs. Los Angeles watershed is one of the most distinctive infrastructure systems in the region. Um, Los Angeles used to have many wetlands uh, with seasonal drainage ways, creeks, and rivers that meander and change paths over time. Frequent flash floods prompted the Army Corps of Engineers to tame the rivers by permanently laying down 570 miles of concrete channels. Um, the anatomy of Los Angeles County watershed that includes Los Angeles River, San Gabriel River, Viona Creek, Dominguez Channel are made of various distinctive components um, totally totaling 1,780 square miles in size. It consists of 1,240 um, miles of surface flow from the mountains um, 
sorry, I'm clicking for it, 480 miles of hard um, bottom channels and 90 miles of soft bottom channels and 1,500 miles of storm drains and 35,000 catch basins. So this is really what the, infra the watershed look is made of within Los Angeles County. Um, this Los Angeles, um, the, the watershed currently has a gross 2,625 acres of spreading grounds and infiltration basins with the ability to capture 21,440 acre feet of stormwater runoff, most of which are located along the San Gabriel River where the soil substrate is gravelly and porous. The total amount of stormwater capture is only 4.3% of total runoff, which eventually flows into the Pacific Ocean every year, and 3.9% of the annual water use for the entire population of Los Angeles. So we're in serious trouble there in LA. Um, the question is, well, what should we do? Uh, we've lived in LA for over six years, um, and it has always been, um, Increasingly, is becoming more and more if, um, more urgent for us to really address this immense metropolis. So it is in this context where IRIS was formed as a venue for research and design to address large infrastructural questions and challenges. Sorry. Um, the Los Angeles um, Office of SWA engages in, in exploratory research through project development, publications, and academia. Maybe I should get back to here. Established as an initiative within the office, research is seen as a testing ground for engaging and defining, redefining infrastructure in context with the future growth of our cities and landscapes. Focus is on the topic of landscape infrastructure as a methodology which expands the parameters of a designed landscape to a multifunctional, high-performance system. This idea is part of a paradigm shift in the understanding of infrastructure, such that concepts of multi-purpose um, programming and the integration of latent ecologies are now of primary consideration. One of the projects in our office is a small park along the Bayona Creek um, corridor. Um, it has a seven mile long back bikeway connecting Los Angeles cities to Marina del Rey. Uh, the linear park is one of the pilot projects that include a series of best management practices, um, which will improve the water quality of runoff diverted through the site prior to discharge into the Bayona Creek. So what you're looking is we're taking water from two of the sub-watersheds in the adjacent neighborhoods and going through this um, treatment train and um, basically bringing water to the park and having some of that water infiltrate into the groundwater um, since we don't have a lot of <laughs> ground, uh, you, good you know, water in the um, down there. And also the, with the excess water, it's uh, diverted back to the uh, channel to the Bayona Creek Channel. In, um, let's see. in conjunction with the project-based work, the Los Angeles office actively participates in design competitions. Um, chosen uh, for their predisposition to infrastructural systems, these competitions provide the opportunity to present a more conceptual research approach wherein both design and narrative are equally expressed. Along a similar track, the office also participates with the University of Southern California teaching studio within the landscape architecture department. Uh, studio and thesis projects often take on the concept of landscape infrastructure as students engage and reimagine landscapes at present and how they are sustained in the future. So this is a Cap Park um, project that's um, right going over the um, the Hollywood Freeway, um, since the freeways in LA pretty much cut off and sever all, a lot of these neighborhoods. So since we don't have a lot of open space available, um, the question of what do you do with these freeways, do you cap them, do you bridge them, uh, these, are, these become one of our um, you know, testing or, or ex studies um, in the studio. Outside of academia, a further extension of the research comes through lectures and publications. Last year, the office published a landscape um, infrastructure case, a 
sorry, last year the office published landscape infrastructure case studies by SWA as part of the documentation of the ongoing and evolving research. The collection of essays within the book uh, stems from lectures given on the topic and a continued dialogue and exchange of ideas between professionals and students interested in the evolution of our cities. So the book is made of several um, different chapters and we try to um, understand um, infrastructure in terms of categories, in terms of how they behave, um, and these are some of the um, components of, um, of this book. That we have been in operation for over six years, both the Los Angeles office and the research initiative are in their infancy. The research is an ongoing endeavor which continues to evolve through design development and documentation in the form of visual representation, writing, lectures, and online media. As an integral part of our daily regimen, infrastructure must be reimagined for the advancement of our culture, ourselves, and lifestyles um, we hope to sustain. That's it. Thanks. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is, uh, speaker is Peter Del Tredici, uh, adjunct associate professor of landscape architecture here at uh, the GSD. He's also a senior research scientist uh, at the Arnold Arboretum, and he's author most recently of a book called Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast. Peter has a BA in zoology from UC Berkeley an MA in biology from the University of Oregon, and a PhD in plant ecology from Boston University. Um, Peter's work importantly challenges dialectics between native and exotic, a theme that uh, came up this morning and I hope that we will return to uh, in the discussion later on. Uh, he very much gives value to adapted urban ecologies. It's a pleasure to have Peter. Well, it's a real pleasure to uh, be able to um, address this audience, and it, it's somewhat intimidating to follow uh, all of the incredible uh, speakers we've had today. Um, I just, to start off, I just want to say that I, I wear two hats here at the design school. I work at the Arnold Arboretum, which is Harvard's Botanical Garden in Boston, and I, uh, I've worked there for about 30 years, and I also teach here at the design school. I've worked here since 1992. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is really... Um, something a little different. And when, the, when I teach the class here at the design school, what I tell my students is, in my classes, you're going to actually look at the landscape from the point of view of the plant, okay? We're gonna pretend that the plant is the client. And the issue is, what is it that you can do that will really you know, meet the needs of the plant? And so today, this is very different from everything you've heard today, which is, I'm gonna sort of talk about how does infrastructure look from the perspective of the plant, okay? And I, I mean that in all seriousness. So we're gonna actually, the scale is gonna go from Christoph's all the way down to the ground level. So it's a little bit different. And the uh, primary metaphor that I'm gonna be used, used today throughout the talk is the metaphor of disturbance. Disturbance, of course, is the great enemy of infrastructure, but disturbance is also one of uh, the prime factors that drive ecological succession. So um, if you look just at the history of Northeastern North America, of course, uh, disturbance, the history of disturbance goes back, you know, at least 10 to 15,000 years ago when most of the Northeast was covered with glaciers. And in a few spots, if you go into the Berkshires, you can find the, the scouring uh, left in the landscape by the glaciers as they receded. So the marks of disturbance are all over the landscape once you know how to identify them. And uh, essentially, the disturbance caused by the early European settlers are also equally apparent 
in the stone walls that lace the landscape. What's really interesting is a lot of people assume that these stone walls, uh, that when the first settlers came, one of the first things they had to do was start picking up the rocks uh, and making stone walls out of them. The fact of the matter is that the stone walls in New England really didn't start appearing uh, in paintings and descriptions until the 1800s, after uh, about 150 years of settlement. And the stone walls, the stones began to emerge from the uh, soil as a result of deforestation and plowing for essentially 150 years. And when the stones started to emerge from the landscape, uh, it caused a little bit of a religious crisis because uh, the clergy interpreted this as a sign from God that uh, they had done something wrong. But these stone walls really, uh, the period of stone wall building is pretty much post-revolutionary, 1890 through the 19, 1820s, 1830s. Um, another bit of infrastructure that most people uh, are not familiar with is the number of dams that existed throughout the Northeast. These are small scale dams for hydropower, for running mills and a variety of other uh, enterprises, a small scale local operation. And you can see the density of the mills uh, in New England, and this would be in the uh, 1840. And if you look at this, this is a, a small section of southeastern Pennsylvania. This is the, a map of the distribution of mills. It's absolutely incredible when you think of this level of infrastructure that existed in the 1840s. And more to the point, oh, excuse me, there was one slide there. I guess I took it out in the interest of time. But what's interesting is all these mills, very few of them are in existence anymore. But as a result of having been in operation for 100 years, the amount of silt that backed up behind those mills created an artificial landscape that once those mills are gone, uh, that, that they completely change the topography. So, you know, just removing the dams doesn't actually recreate the original topography because you still have 100 years of silt built up, built up behind them. Um, another bit of infrastructure that uh, people have forgotten, of course, is the, the era of the horse and buggy, and that uh, in the early evolution of uh, most cities, horses did an enormous amount of, of heavy lifting and there were tens of thousands of horses in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and uh, the problems associated with them were very great, such that in the very first urban planning conference ever held in the United States, uh, the major problem was the disposal of horse manure, and I love the fact that they predicted by 1950, uh, the cities would be buried under nine feet of horse manure. Uh, that is an astounding. Uh, statistic. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and very early on, uh, and he, this would be uh, in the early, in the mid 1800s, a French scientist, as long as we're bashing the French, uh, was experimenting with silkworm trying to build a hardier silkworm that could be grown in Massachusetts, and he inadvertently introduced the gypsy moth from Europe, which caused, it took about 20 years for it to really become established, but once it did that, it spread like crazy, and sort of the, uh, it caused enormous problems. It started out in, uh, in Massachusetts, in Middlesex County, and spread from there. And in response to that, Massachusetts, always a progressive state, decided that they were going to battle the gypsy moth to the death. The, it was elimination, okay? It wasn't control. We are going to eliminate this. And all of this high-pressure sprayers were all invented in Massachusetts in the 1890s specifically for uh, battling the gypsy moth. And not only that, the weapon of choice was uh, arsenate of lead. Uh, very early on, again, another product developed in Massachusetts. And if you take a soil sample from virtually any town in eastern Massachusetts, particularly along the roadways, you're going to find residues of lead arsenate from this massive gypsy moth spraying that uh, went on for about 10 years. And this is a legacy of that little bit of infrastructure. Uh, the lead arsenate was replaced with DDT. Uh, in the 1940s, right after World War II, and that then uh, was used widely 
uh, up until the 1960s when Silent Spring was published and uh, the use of that insecticide was curtailed. But these kinds of changes uh, are ongoing. Uh, there's a, a bug, the Asian longhorn beetle. 30,000 trees were removed from the city of Worcester uh, as a result of being infested by the Asian longhorn beetle in, in 2008. And for those of you who live in the Midwest, I don't have to tell you about the emerald ash borer, which is another problem that is, again, it's associated with our infrastructure and the question of how plants interact with urban infrastructure is a very, very important and uh, it's, a, it's something that landscape architects, I think, need to spend more time thinking about. Um, the city itself is a unique environment. Um, I don't have to say any more about that. And this is the range map from my book, Wild Urban Plants. And this is a, a map that I got from Allen Berger. It shows the uh, density of the human population in the Northeast, uh, Detroit, in the west, Boston in the east, Montreal in the north, Washington DC in the south. 500 people per square mile, which is essentially one definition of what constitutes urban. And of course, uh, following Ying Yu's presentation, uh, there's the Los Angeles River. And if you, you know, take a look at this as you're flying into LAX, uh, you know, the concept that there's any native ecology here or that there's any plants that are native to this kind of area, this, this landscape, it, it's an absurdity. There's been, I mean, it's a, it is, there, there are plants, you can talk about plants that used to grow here, there's no doubt about that, but to say that there's some vegetation that is native to this area, uh, to me, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Uh, and cities, of course, are, uh, they have their own ecology, not the least of which is the uh, urban heat island effect, and you can see on the horizontal axis, city populations go up to a million, and on the uh, vertical axis, uh, that would be temperature difference between an adjacent uh, rural area and an adjacent urban area, and that's in degrees centigrade, and so on a warm summer night, you can have as much as uh, 12 degrees centigrade difference in temperature. So this is, you know, the urban areas have their own, they are their own unique ecosystems. And, you know, they're not necessarily, uh, you can't put them in categories of, you know, this is a native ecosystem. Now, this is some work done by Lucy Hutra at uh, Boston University. And this is the Boston area. And you can see that she ran a transect, that's zero, that's downtown Boston, and 100 kilometers is the Harvard Forest in Peter Sam, Massachusetts. And you go, they, they drove their vehicle uh, they go straight out Route 2, that's what this transect is, and then they, they, they measured the amount of impervious surface in uh, square kilometer blocks adjacent to that transect. And what's really interesting is that everything inside the 95, the I-95 beltway uh, has a 30% or more impervious surface. Once you cross 95, all of a sudden, uh, virtually all, there's one sim single exception there in Lemonster or uh, Fitchburg, um, all of the, the land essentially has less than 30% uh, paving. And what's important about this is that this is, you can define urbanization clearly by the extent of impervious surface. You don't have to define urbanization from the point of view of the density of the human population. And when you start talking about ecological impacts and you start talking about, you know, what are plants responding to, they're responding to the density of impervious surface. And when you have a density roughly of 30% impervious surface, you have a fully urbanized condition regardless of the density of the human population. I think this is a very important uh, thing to take into consideration as we sort of talk about what is urban, what is urbanization. Now, I mentioned glaciers uh, early on, and I consider uh, urbanization to be akin to glaciation. And of course, the heavy equipment that's used in all of our construction activities, uh, the urban glacier. And what does the urban glacier leave in its wake but compacted glacial till. Uh, 
There's no doubt about this. That is the nature of urbanization, is to wipe everything out. And then we go through the process of rebuilding uh, the environment. Um, little things that we don't pay much attention to. Road salt, it, particularly in temperate areas, is ubiquitous in the urban environment. And the biological effects are profound. It increases soil compaction. It decreases water availability. It interferes with cation exchange, the ability of plants to absorb mineral nutrients, and it elevates the soil pH. So just the simple application of road salt to an environment completely alters the soil biology. And, you know, we know that, you know, the minute the snow, a snowflake hits the ground, the road crews are out there spreading salt because nobody wants to compromise public safety for the sake of a few plants. Uh, the plants, of course, are well aware of what's going on, and many of our uh, roadside vegetation, uh, one everybody's familiar with, Ilanthus altissima from China, likes a high pH soil and is extremely tolerant of soil compaction. And so the vegetation that is lining our highways uh, is in direct response to the heavy application of road salt that's been going on uh, basically for the last 50 years. Other factors that characterize the urban environment, uh, acid precipitation, uh, again, it lowers soil pH and increases both the nitrogen and sulfur content of the soil. So these are, these are huge selective forces that dramatically impact which plants grow where. So when you increase the nitrogen and sulfur content, that radically alters the soil chemistry. And that is, you know, the distribution of plants is pretty much determined by the nature of the soil. I like this again uh, for Ying Yu. I put this in here. No, not really. Um, but the thing about uh, urban area is fragmentation. This is the Arroyo Seco Parkway in Los Angeles. On the left is the roadway that was built in 1930. Uh, no fragmentation. And on the right, the uh, that used to be two ways, that tunnel on the left. And then, of course, that uh, filled up very rapidly. They had to build uh, another extension of that, which they did on the right in the late 1950s. And again, you immediately see the impact of fragmentation and the inability of uh, certainly plants. That, that becomes a major barrier for the migration of plants. And of course, it radically alters uh, the soil characteristics on either side of that highway. So these are all sort of general principles of, uh, you know, what's the environment in the urban areas look like. This is a, uh, I took this picture at Rutgers, New Jersey. Uh, this is the Raritan River. That's a canal, actually. And that's the towpath that the animals that were pulling the, 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 the canal boats uh, between Princeton and uh, New Brunswick that they took. This was built in the early 1800s. And there's been a lot of talk about roads. And one of the things that's really a lot of people aren't aware of the fact is that for all the studies that have been done on invasive species and what are the factors that control the distribution and spread of invasive species, the one factor that pops up in virtually every case that's been studied is that you can explain the distribution of invasive species by their proximity to a road. That's what roads are all about. It's all about fragmentation and creating an edge and a lot of the species, invasive species, uh, thrive in edge conditions. So roadways and invasive species are intimately associated. And, you know, this is a picture from Detroit. And I have a few pictures at the sort of end of my talk that I want to sort of talk about how vegetation uh, sort of deals with infrastructure when it's left to its own devices, once it's been abandoned. Because that's very instructive. And I love this loading dock wetland uh, in Detroit where somehow or other the drainage uh, was, in, was plugged up for something. The phragmitis moved in. Uh, Red-winged blackbirds appeared. And you actually have a functional landscape, a functional, excuse me, a functional wetland 
uh, beginning to establish in the middle of this uh, intensely industrial section of Detroit. Another example, um, this is the famous uh, Jersey City Terminal. Uh, you can see lower Manhattan there up in the upper left-hand side of this. this. This is the massive hundreds of acre rail yard that used to transport, you know, thousands of tons of materials and passengers to New York City uh, every day. This is what it looked like in 1949. And uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, Liberty State Park, if you've never been there, uh, you can actually go to the Statue of Liberty from Liberty State, that's from the New Jersey side, and the perimeter of the park is very well maintained and managed, and there's lots of amenities for tourists and local people. Uh, it's maintained like a uh, typical urban park, but the center of Liberty State Park is a wild, unremediated woodland that is essentially fenced off. It's about 100 hectares, heavily contaminated with heavy metals and petroleum products from the train era. And what's really exciting is that there's a plan underway. They're actually going to take that fence down. They're going to build a walkway through it. So as long as people don't come in direct contact with the soil, the state has said it's OK. And it's going to be what I call the first German-style nature park uh, in the United States. So it's really, uh, you know, what you're seeing here is plants, and I apologize for this, Pierre, not so much as infrastructure, but plants as anti-infrastructure. Uh, good. Um, <laughs> that's what you're getting. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, and, you, and, and Germany is really the leaders in, in this field of really dealing with the reality of vegetation in an urban context. Uh, this is uh, the Duisburg Nord. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this project. It's the you know the heart of the industrial uh, part of West Germany. Uh, the steel mills that were there were shut down in the 1970s, and essentially they just walked away from it. And the mills are, uh, some of them have been torn down, but a lot of them are still standing. And the vegetation that dominates this area um, is mostly just what grows there. Some of it's European native, some of it's from Asia, some of it's from North America. But uh, the Germans essentially consider it part of urban nature. There's essentially 30 towns that are connected by over 600 kilometers of bike path. And it's a wonderful resource that uh, draws a fair amount of tourists over the years. Now, uh, I did want to sort of, by way of summing up, talk a little bit about um, a brief history of what I call uh, the relationship between ecology and infrastructure uh, in North America over the past century. So the first phase from 1900 to 1930, automobile replaces the horse, railroad expansion, industrial pollution, agricultural abandonment, urban growth, exotic plant introductions from Asia, energy from coal, and the big environmental issue was sanitation. How do we make our cities health, healthy uh, for the human population? The next phase, the destruction of the old order, the Great Depression, World War II, uh, ag more agricultural abandonment, energy from coal and oil, and of course, the big issue is soil erosion. This is when many of the invasive species were actually planted under subsidy from uh, the U.S. Soil Conservation Service were initially planted kudzu. Uh, people, you know, got paid 10 cents a plant for planting kudzu. Uh, 13 million of them were planted mainly along railroad rights of way throughout the South. So, you know, if you can't become invasive after 13 million of you have been planted, <laughs> then something is seriously wrong. Uh, suburban fragmentation, 1950 to 1990. Uh, you know, this is now we're getting into people's lifespans, but what's interesting is this is, uh, you know, the era of Earth Day and environmental pollution was the central uh, ecological paradigm of the day. And here we are today, uh, globalization is really what it's all about. 
Uh, China emerges as a major economic power, consumer culture is out of control, and the big issue is climate change. And really what we're looking at is, uh, in the same way that our economy and our culture has been totally globalized, the ecology has been globalized. Whether you like it or not, or whether you think it's a good idea, the fact of the matter is it has happened. And uh, it, there's no going back. And I really hate diagrams, very complex interlocking diagrams, but here I've created one. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's a... It really talks about this issue of you know, native vegetation versus um, what was referred to earlier as novel ecosystems. And you can see that there's a little bit of back and forth depending on you know, the, the nature and the intensity of the agriculture or the logging. Uh, you can do that without necessarily eliminating native vegetation. But once that native forest has been converted to uh, a suburban uh, situation, uh, once the soil has been disturbed, you can't actually have native vegetation without having native soil. This is a basic principle. Once you destroy the native layered soil structure, uh, it, you, you no longer have the capacity to actually build a native ecosystem. So depending upon the intensity of the land use, once that land is converted, essentially you'll get a forest back on that land, but it's going to be a whole new kind of forest, one of these novel ecosystems or uh, as I like to call it, an emergent forest. So I think this is a, you know, just a succinct way of putting it. Now, uh, the, f the future ecosystem trends that I see happening in urban areas, um, the interacting forces of urbanization, and the key word is interacting, climate change and globalization are chronic stress factors. Okay, that's as opposed to a traumatic stress factor, which would be a hurricane. That's a traumatic stress factor. These are chronic stress factors, which uh, the impact is slow and constant, destabilize native ecosystems, and favor the spread of opportunistic species. That's a euphemism for invasive plants. Um, Water, air, and soil pollution impact soil chemistry, which impacts microbial activity, which impacts nutrient cycling and vegetation patterns. And habitat fragmentation creates sunny edges, which are dominated by non-native disturbance adapted species. So these are the, this is what is, you know, these are the forces that are essentially driving vegetational patterns uh, in our urban areas. And this is my final slide. I'll leave you uh, with this message, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Peter. I think uh, Peter's discussion of, of altered landscapes sets up very well our next speaker, uh, Dirk Siemens. Uh, Dirk uh, has a degree in engineering, uh, he studied architecture and planning uh, at the Technical University of Delft, practices as a landscape architect uh, in the Netherlands, um, and is one of three founders of H plus N plus S Landscape Architects. Uh, Dirk's also chairman of the board of OASE, Scientific Bilingual Journal on Architectural Theory. Um, he's widely published uh, he's currently Professor of Environmental Design at TU Delft. Um, his Dutch dialogues are the go-to place to talk about the relationships between land and water in the Netherlands. And I think significantly for our discussions, he was the first state landscape architect of the Netherlands between 2004 and 2008. I think we heard this morning um, a remark that in many ways the Army Corps of Engineers is the default uh, land use planner at, national, at the national level in the United States. Um, though I heard from my friend, my new friend Kevin from the Army Corps last night that actually they don't do a lot of um, the setting of the agenda. The agenda is given to them uh, by the pools of money that are, are appropriated for them in Washington, D.C. And so in radical contrast, here we have a landscape architect operating at the national level, helping to inform policy uh, on land use, environment, uh, and infrastructure. 
uh, Dirk Siemens. Thank you, Chris. Great to be here. Um, for the last talk, uh, I admire your stamina. <laughs> and, uh, well, um, I want to start uh, where uh, uh, Earl Ellis uh, uh, left us. These pictures never fail uh, to produce uh, fascination and fear, in a way. And uh, we are looking in the mirror as humankind. And this is uh, indeed uh, the era of the Anthropocene. Uh, but I think we see also another angle, the angle that uh, the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk calls this is the era of fossil expressionism. <laughs> what you see is the Earth lightening up uh, through electricity uh, powered by uh, coal, gas, oil, etc., etc. And he says, well, I wonder what the Earth will look like uh, after uh, this windfall of 500 or 600 years of fossil energy will be gone. Will it be lighting up uh, like that? So there are multiple angles to look at this, at this picture. But one of them is, of course, that urbanization is, uh, well, uh, showing that uh, humankind is a global force. And uh, if you take that to graphs, you see that uh, a lot of uh, elements uh, linked to population are going through the ceiling in uh, these decennia, uh, decennia uh, water use, ozone layer depletion, etc., etc. You all know the whole story. But what is, I think, important to, uh, uh, to, to uh, observe is that a lot of uh, problems, key problems in this graph, uh, are linked to urbanization or at least have an urban aspect to it. And if we look uh, like uh, what uh, the, the, the size and the uh, configuration on our planet of urbanization is, you see that in 2050, the UNESCO expects almost 60% of uh, the uh, Earth inhabitants to live in cities, and 30% are living in deltas or and coastal cities. So we can narrow that down quite a bit. And I think, well, it might seem an impossible task, but we can, in a way, produce a, a, a beginning of a diagnosis of what we have to do. Uh, and I think what we see in coastal and delta cities is the combination of uh, having almost the best, uh, the best uh, agricultural land uh, in deltas, uh, flat, uh, mostly clay, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the combination with also the most important wetlands of the world that are uh, indirectly, uh, uh, indirectly responsible for the health of our coastal uh, fisheries. And, of course, they are the cradle to our urban civilization. The oldest uh, urbanization started in, uh, 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 in deltas and never stopped uh, there. And what you see is that uh, everywhere in the world there is the same succession. Uh, the city can pay more for the land than agriculture. Agriculture shifts and reclaims another piece of wetland, etc., etc. And for us in the Netherlands, of course, we have come to the end of this uh, race after a thousand year of reclamation uh, 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 tradition. We are, uh, so to speak, with our back to the wall because there is nothing, no more wetlands to reclaim in a way. And all these deltas, uh, well, are are vulnerable, to make it even more complex, to the effects of uh, global uh, uh, heating and uh, global climate change. That is not only the water uh, uh, effects, too much, too uh, little water, but also the urban heat island effect. And for us as practitioners, I would uh, suggest that predict and control and also traditional master planning 
will not do the job if we want to get this task done, if we even want to try uh, to get on this task. And my, uh, uh, my guess would be that we would be stopping boxing against uh, urbanization and the whole process. And I think we better uh, try to identify, let's say, the formative forces that are at work in this urbanization, try to identify them one by one, and try to, let's say, conquer them as uh, uh, design uh, uh, objects, and not only that, I think they are all instruments in indirectly guiding urbanization. They might be uh, the instruments we are looking for. And uh, we could look at, uh, let's say, the urban metabolism to look for the instruments we find there. We find food production. We find building materials. We find drinking water production, the energy. How does the city gets its energy. These are all elements that indirectly will guide uh, uh, an urbanizing world. And uh, I want to uh, present two cases here, uh, two judo cases, one with societal forces. And this case, in a, let's say, really paranormal way, is the Arna Futkoi case. And, uh, well, this is also showing that globalization is really there because uh, I'm going to present the Arna Furtkori case uh, done for a Dutch client, uh, the fifth uh, architectural biennale. And Enrique, uh, Enriqueta and Eduardo were presenting a case for a Dutch client, uh, the Berlage Institute. And here we are at the GSD in Harvard presenting both uh, a case uh, and without knowing of each other's work. And that is absolutely stunning, I, uh, uh, I think. And that, there you see that Holland is a very large country where uh, <laughs> you can miss each other. And also, I'm going to show that, uh, well, designing is not a science uh, because we came to slightly different conclusions, but I think in one way uh, quite comparable. This is uh, Arna Futkoi. Uh, uh, Enriqueta and Eduardo already showed that. This is the uh, situation of the third bridge, and these are the crazy projects, uh, like they call it in Ankara and in uh, Istanbul, that uh, Premier Erdogan is uh, proposing. And the craziest project is making a second Bosporus. Well, uh, that's something, I think, uh, for uh, uh, Christophe with his uh, uh, point clouds. Uh, and he's also, <laughs> because you have to be even-handed, uh, not only uh, doing on the west side a, a second Bosporus, he also is thinking about a third Bosporus at the east side, at the Asian side of... Uh, well, but our client, in a way, is, well, a rather suburban, still suburban uh, 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 municipality that finds itself in the eye of a planning cyclone, in a way. And uh, the cyclone uh, is building up. Uh, this is the historical development of uh, Istanbul. Uh, five million in uh, 1980 and 11 million uh, inhabitants in uh, 2000, and uh, this is uh, the spread of the population. They will grow to 16 and a half million uh, people uh, after the third bridge uh, will be uh, uh, will be there, and that makes Istanbul, uh, I think, the third or fourth largest uh, 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 city of the world, and. Uh, one of the still growing uh, ones, a really megalopolis of the first kind, uh, because the urbanization goes in a way all around uh, the Sea of Marmara here. This is what Istanbul looks like. These are uh, modern, uh, uh, let's say, 21st century extensions. This is uh, one of the uh, drinking water basins near the Arne Futkoi region. And of course, I must uh, haste 
to say they have a master plan for six years now. But this master plan is really, you, you can see the battle between this enormous urbanization uh, on the one, one hand and uh, the precise analysis of uh, 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 the biodiversity and forest and the protection side on the other one. And there is, uh, well, this is just one uh, 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 slice in time of this, uh, of this huge battle that is going on. And uh, needless to say that almost nobody looks or listens to uh, the master plan because it is a sort of... Uh, you must uh, uh, imagine that this city is for 80% illegal if you look at the master plan. And it is a sort of ex post planning that is absolutely fantastic. Here you see, on t <laughs> this is an enormous uh, uh, industrial estate in Arna Vutkoy. And you see that they laid a tracer paper over an aerial photograph and now are projecting the roads that aren't there. They, they have to sort of inject roads in there because all the trucks were just driving over the rubble, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a sort of ex post planning uh, 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 kind of attitude that we uh, uh, see there. And if we try to, let's say, choose our instruments, uh, then uh, I think we would be well advised to choose water and the black infrastructure of uh, the roads to try to guide this new step in urbanization. And water is not for the first and not for the second, but for the third time uh, on the critical path of urban growth in, uh, 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 in Istanbul. They think they going to uh, uh, have three and a half uh, million more inhabitants in uh, uh, 2020. Uh, and, well, they don't have any water. And I think uh, they might need uh, a sort of mentality again of uh, those people who made the Ottoman uh, uh, waterworks in the uh, 17th and 18th century, which are by any standard uh, uh, impressive. Uh, they got water from 16 kilometers uh, from the center of, uh, of Istanbul and uh, at the end, well, you might have visited the underworld cisterns of, uh, uh, of Istanbul that could hold uh, 100,000 cubic meters uh, at their full capacity. You only, as a tourist, of course, see them with uh, low water, but they could fill up uh, up till the top of the columns. And they are, of course, in Istanbul thinking how uh, they are going to deal with this water shortage. At one hand, you see real impressive and uh, ambitious uh, savings programs going be uh, taken into effect. But on the other hand, in the business as usual way, they are thinking, well, if these basins aren't enough, we are going to uh, shift to this one and maybe at the Bulgarian border, there are an enormous amount of uh, possibilities to make lakes, etc., etc. So, in the end, uh, this will uh, produce an uh, infrastructure of almost 200 kilometers to the west and to the east, but at the same time, draining millions of acres of uh, 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 agricultural land from uh, the water. So. We proposed to our client, uh, which was also not only the A IABR, but also the municipality of Arne Vutkoy, to try to look uh, closer to home. And these are the possibilities, if you look at the geomorphological map of the different watersheds, even every watershed has uh, the possibility of uh, hosting uh, a, a, a reservoir. And now, I enter uh, one of the most uh, specific actors in the field that is already uh, introduced by Enrique and Eduardo, that is the ISKI, that is the Water Management Board of Istanbul. And these guys are really 
they don't, uh, uh, you don't fuck around with ISKI, uh, <laughs> they say. <laughs> These are their protection zones uh, uh, around uh, uh, the reservoirs, and uh, they are very strict about it because they already lost a reservoir. That is the Kuchuk uh, Cheshime reservoir in the south. They lost it to pollution and uh, uh, illegal uh, uh, building in the vicinity of the reservoir. And, well, what you see is that, uh, of course, every master plan has a maze and uh, uh, in this city where everybody builds illegal, uh, uh, it is a very strange contrast that if you do so in the protective zones of uh, uh, the ISKI, your building is going to be demolished. They're going to spot you in Google Earth, and they're coming to you, and you have two choices. Either we destroy your building, or you do it yourself. And it has to be done in 24 hours. And most people choose for the second possibility because then they can recycle the building material. But this is the inspectors seeing an illegal house. This is what happens. And this is the after. And they have enormous piles of reports of all the 1,763 cases that they uh, handled in this way in the last six years. So uh, what we said to Iski is, well, keep up the good work, but you are, <laughs> you are not going, you are not, I repeat, not going to withstand this enormous pressure that is building up around the reservoirs without changing the way you look at it. This is uh, the Zasli der Basin in Arne Vutkoi, and this is uh, the uh, main player in the rest of my uh, story. And what they typically do on all the basins is that they have uh, the protection zones drawn out uh, on a, let's say, uh, a, a, a typical way. 300 meters is 300 meters, so they start at the at the basin itself and make a 300 meter line. Around that, a 1,000 meter line, and around that, a 2,000 meter line, etc., etc. And uh, all these uh, zones have, uh, well, uh, land uses that are possible. In the 300 meter zone, uh, they are completely uh, protective. That is a nature zone. but. Well, you can ask yourself which nature. Eh? It is a little bit a, met a, a metaphor. Uh, uh, so is uh, the eco-agriculture. That sounds extremely uh, uh, sympathetic, but uh, there is no eco-agriculture uh, there because there is no water. Because agriculture is strictly forbidden to tap wa water out of the reservoir. So. What we basically try to do is to, uh, let's say, make all these zones come to life and uh, provide every zone with a functional land use and relate the zones uh, to the real topography and making clear boundaries between the zones. And uh, here, for instance, uh, uh, near the reservoir water, what we do is, uh, yes, indeed, we make a little levy. We are Dutch, uh, <laughs> so we make levies uh, with uh, a little bypass of uh, possible run of water because there is, uh, on certain spots, there is agriculture of people who arrange their own water system and run off can indeed uh, bring nutrients, etc., etc., to uh, the reservoir. So what we do is making uh, a functional nature zone and a bypass that the water is entering uh, the reservoir only here. Uh, and, uh, well, we did uh, that for all the zones. This is the functional nature I just showed you with the levee. We need a grassland buffer that is of variable uh, 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 with. Uh, I shall go into that uh, later because I have 
uh, one minute left. Um, this is a zone of precision agriculture, and the precision ag agriculture is being fed by water, grey water and black water uh, from uh, the city on top. Uh, and uh, the city is on top, that is very counterintuitively, uh, at the watershed, a 200, 300 meter zone at the top of the watershed. And in between is forestation or existing forests. And forests are very important in the Istanbuli uh, mind because uh, that are the, picture uh, the uh, picnic er areas in uh, the weekends. And so all the forests are strictly protected too, and are even exploited. You have to pay uh, to get into uh, 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 the forest. And this is the rich city uh, we propose uh, uh, there. This is what it looks like in cross-section. And in landscape architectural sense, we are working with very, very simple uh, ingredients. Uh, Little levees I showed you, hedgerows, prominent uh, lines of trees uh, that are the, also the borders between the zones, forest boundaries, precision agriculture, and uh, uh, purification uh, filters. And all these elements, of course, have uh, a different uh, 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 use. And, well, of course... Of course, this is not going to feed this enormous city, uh, the little agriculture that we bring there. But it might indeed uh, fill the niches of, uh, let's say, regional products, uh, which in, in Istanbul is a, a teemingly mod modern city, and they are also very interested in uh, uh, ecological products. Here you see a forest picnic. Uh, and of course, the hedgerows that we use are hazelnuts, hazelnuts being one of the most uh, 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 important agricultural export products of, uh, the, uh, uh, of Turkey. So what we try to do is let the city provide the water for agriculture, and agriculture in a way protects the reservoir, and the reservoir quenches the city. Uh, this precision farming uh, it makes uh, from the black water and uh, grey water, uh, it makes it possible for uh, that 5,000 inhabitants in the city uh, produce the water for 10 hectares. So what we basically do uh, is uh, that the uh, one-way street to the Bosporus, that uh, is the water system, how it works now, uh, of course, it is uh, the wastewater is treated, but sludge, etc., are uh, uh, being uh, uh, offloaded in the Sea of Marmara. We try to change that into Sabine. This is for you. Uh, this is the Paris 19th century system, with the only uh, uh, the, the the only difference is that uh, we are uh, introducing biochar and biochar production. Uh, as an intermediate to fertilize uh, this precision uh, agriculture. And, well, this is what the rich city uh, could look like. This is real Istanbul at its, uh, at its very best. Uh, because of uh, the high density uh, we uh, uh, sort of accommodate on the rich, also uh, types of public transport are possible, and this is how you look from one side rich city to the other side uh, rich city. This is, of course, one of our own uh, uh, and very romantic uh, 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 visualizations because it, in reality it would look like uh, this. And to conclude, I think that rich and reservoir city uh, could be a sustainable alternative where apparently conflicting dynamics become mutually dependent and reinforcing. And I think uh, we devised an occupation strategy uh, that bypasses the dilemma between preservation and growth. In a way, three and a half million new inhabitants are more than welcome in this way, because more city is more water, is 
new agriculture, is new economy, is a better protection of the... Uh, so this is... Uh, how uh, I showed you on the automatic pilot uh, uh, Istanbul looks like. And if you would do the Arna Vutkoy trick around every basin, this would be uh, the configuration of Istanbul in uh, uh, the future. Of course, we did this uh, with our local uh, Arna Vutkoy partners, and we are going to uh, uh, make uh, uh, four pilots in the next years because they really want to try if this uh, can really work. And uh, as a present, uh, because 400 years of relationships between uh, Holland and the Sultan of Istanbul and now Turkey uh, is being celebrated, uh, uh, the mayor of Rotterdam uh, handed the plan to the uh, mayor of Istanbul who, by a strange st uh, strike of, uh, 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 let's say, um, um, it's very strange. The, the man is called Top Baas, which means in Holland, uh, Top Boss. Uh, well, um, that was my story about uh, the first uh, judo, the second judo, was that with natural force, uh, forces, and well, we have to skip that. And I hope somebody uh, will ask me uh, something. Uh, wh what do you do with coastal defense in the Netherlands? And then I say, <laughs> well, I'm very glad you asked this question. Great, thanks. Uh, we're running a little behind. I'd like to have all the speakers come up to the uh, front desks, uh, tables, uh, take your places, and we'll have a um, discussion for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then Pierre promises me that you'll get a two-minute break uh, before the final roundtable. Your seat. Well, you're in the middle. You're not at the end. No, if you, you hide under the table, I wouldn't be She did fine. Mr. Thank you for all your emails. Well, yeah, <laughs> we are a bit intimidated, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> Dirk's talking. Yeah, he's he's spun off. Currently. Uh, it's over. <laughs> we actually know what everyone's going to do. So we can do the thing with the ass and five questions. Yeah. Well, and you can answer the question you want. You don't have to answer all of them, right? That, that seems like a good idea. Well, that, that is another fantastically varied and penetrating panel. We have to thank Pierre, I think, for what is surely now recognized as a masterful curation of a, a chorus of voices, all of whom have really speculated on the implications of a more dynamic, flexible, adaptive, and open systems-based perspective on infrastructure. And this panel in particular, I think, has risen to that occasion. What Chris and I would like to do for... Uh, this last session uh, before we move into the wrap-up is to just provide a short synopsis of our observations, uh, what the panel has offered us, and pose three questions. One of Shirley is going to have to do with coastal defense. And I'm kidding. And then open that up to, we'll use that to kickstart a conversation and then open it up to the floor. And we hope that you'll follow up some of these questions or introduce new themes of your own. The themes that, it seems to me at least, have united and resonated with the panelists this afternoon are several, uh, and one of which leaps out immediately is the integration of theory and practice, all of their 
work and analysis shows some reflexive work of applied research and research in practice. All of them have referenced interdisciplinarity, and to be clear, by this we mean not just noisy crosstalk between the disciplines, multidisciplinarity, but true transactions of knowledge that go across disciplinary boundaries. All of them have either implicit or in some cases explicit recognition of a nonlinear world where dynamism and change are the norm, not perturbations or unusual disturbances. And if they've talked about disturbance, they've recharacterized it, both in their work and in their analysis. They've talked about cycles and processes, loops and linkages, systems in other words. All have shown some appreciation and I think explicit awareness of the multiplicity of knowledge across multiple scales and the scale dependency and the precision of scale dependency of that knowledge. With this, of course, comes the concomitant recognition of the decline of our ability, I think, to rely on conventional forms of knowledge, conventional tools, and I think a movement towards new forms of knowledge in addition to a revaluation or recognition of the value of local knowledge, scale-dependent knowledge again, and new types of agency that emerge from that recognition of different types of knowledge. So from those observations, we have three preliminary questions to kick off the conversation. And I have to say, I, I'm rather gracefully sidestepping the temptation to refer to waste, toxicity, excrement, bodily fluids. But I do have one question that relates to fluidity first. But you can decide whether to pursue it on the bodily basis or otherwise. All of the panel, and, well, I'm serious. It was tempting to raise that question since it was a theme, an emergent theme of the day. Um, take that for what you will in terms of the implications for infrastructure. All of the presentations on this panel have dealt in some way with processes, particularly some ecological processes. And these take us past some outmoded emphases on static structures or form towards a focus on function and flows. So if we expand the definition of infrastructure to include not only its form and its function, but its flows, in other words, if we recharacterize infrastructure as fluid, what implications for its future design do you see? So that's one question, and I'm going to just give them to you right now so you can answer the ones that you think apply to you since they will apply to some members of the panel more than others. The second question has to do with the referencing of several important concepts related to systems thinking, to flexibility, adaptation, and in particular, implied resilience. And I'd like to follow this concept up a little bit because resilience is widely, being, widely used now in the vernacular and in the popular press and even by politicians to talk about resilient urban, urbanism, resilient economics, it seems that anything can be resilient if we'd like it to be. And while integral to a, a dynamic living systems context, resiliency is rarely defined and often used in the context that implies a return to some state of recognized normal. And that's what we generally call, at least in ecological thinking, engineering re resilience, bouncing back to normal. But if we use resilience in an ecological sensibility, it means the recovery of function, so a return to some state, the ability to withstand disturbance and perturbation, and a return to some state of function, but the structures might be different. That state of normal might be a different or new state of normal. So if we were to talk about ecological resilience applied to infrastructure, what might our infrastructures look like? What implications for the design uh, would this have of our infrastructure and with it our definitions of nature? And finally, if you've got the time or stomach or energy for it, it seems that all of you have talked about collaboration, the multiplicity of scalar knowledge. And this leads us, I think, to an important point that was raised several times this morning and also by one of our own panelists, by Wendy Goldsmith, as a question to the middle panel in the morning. And this has to do with the question of governance. So I'd like to ask you, what do you see as the key challenges for governance in the face of increasing risk increasing urgency for decision-making, particularly in the face of some recognized limits to scientific knowledge in this case of that immediacy, immediate need for information, along with new forms of emergent agency. What are those challenges for governance? That is to say, the management side of design, how we manage, deploy, and make decisions about our design governance writ large. So those are the kickoff questions, and I would uh, welcome your participation in whatever uh, category you'd like to offer it. And then we'll ask about coastal defense. Okay. 
So you start at, uh, at my side. Um, I've, well, of course, um, uh, feel attracted to the first question, uh, the, the, the question of the fluid, uh, the fluidity of our infrastructure. And I heard you almost say the precious body fluid, which I know from uh, Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> uh, know your classics. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I don't think um, uh, all the infrastructure uh, must be thought of as fluid. I think uh, the infrastructures that uh, can help us uh, uh, steering large cities or uh, parts of cities uh, will be indeed uh, hard. Uh, but I think we uh, must learn and we already have a, a lot of empery ab ab about it, that these infrastructures indirectly steer social, uh, spatial, economical processes. And if we know uh, what their effect is or has been, you can use them as an instrument. And these social, spatial uh, uh, processes uh, seen on the long term are indeed fluid. Uh, so it will be a mix between, let's say, uh, real hardcore infrastructure uh, and uh, the processes reacting to that, uh, that will both be in our toolbox. Um, if I'll, t I'll do the next one. If, if you look at the issue of resiliency, which you're defining as a sort of a property, an ecosystem property, but you can also, is this turned on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I actually define it as a property uh, actually of the plant. Uh, and if you think about a tree and you cut it down and it sprouts back, that's a very resilient species. And one of the attributes of the spontaneous vegetation that flourishes in many of our urban areas is they're nothing if not resilient, their ability to come back following disturbance. Because disturbance is really one of the distinguishing characteristics of most uh, urban environments. and. I think this is a very important principle that, you know, this vegetation that, uh, you know, very few people give much uh, credence to. It's looked down upon as, as a weedy or whatever, uh, non-native. But in fact, it's providing ecological services at virtually no cost to the taxpayer, which makes it actually not only resilient, but also highly sustainable. I think that's very important. And then the other point, just to sort of uh, reiterate something that I said earlier, which is when you do talk about disturbance or perturbation, there, there are really two levels. One is this traumatic, disastrous uh, disturbance associated with flooding and hurricanes and things like that. But I think a more significant and insidious form of disturbance is this chronic disturbance, which is what acid precipitation is, what climate change is, and thinking about resiliency to those kinds of uh, disturbance is very, very important. Here you go. Um, so I guess what I'm interested um, has to do with this idea of flexibility and adaptability. Um, I think, I mean, having lived in Los Angeles, I think um, so much of our infrastructure is other, nothing but not adaptable and, and not flexible. And But one thing that's kind of interesting, um, a gr sort of a trend that start, that's happening, at least uh, started in New York City, um, Broadway um, corridor, and now it's sort of taking on all over the West Coast is this idea of temporary landscapes um, along streets. Um, so even Los Angeles is starting to take on the idea of parklets. Uh, <laughs> and then these, um, you know, the parking day was was really a very inspiring um, phenomenon that people are starting to think, well, can the streets be trans transient, you know, temporary, that it has the ability to not only, you know, being for the cars, but that there are days that it, the streets could be closed or you know certain things could be placed on the streets um so it's 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 not like i mean it's not water it's not but it is about another aspect of fluidity and mobility within cities that 
you know, we, I mean, so much, so much part of our lives, and it's very hard to not think about it in those terms. But in doing so, you're really emphasizing the ephemerality and the transient nature yeah. of these ecosystems as, let me just say from a public perspective, potentially legitimate. You're offering them as legitimate spaces that while transient and ephemeral, they're part of that right. moving process. Yeah, and then, I mean, there's part of this idea of contingent landscape um, where, you know, can you can you do something that really it's unplanned on streets? You know, we we had these film filming that goes on in LA um, street. You know, so there's a lot of these kind of surprises that happen um, as you traverse through the streets. Um, this taco truck phenomenon, and I mean, it's, it's very much it's a very different kind of landscape, um, very different than what we've been talking about today. S but then I still think it is part of the urban infrastructure. Thank you for answering two questions at once. The getting at the definitions of new natures as well. I appreciate that. Kevin? I think I'll address the third question of governance. Um, you know, I think we have abandoned our responsibility to engage ourselves in the decision making about infrastructure. I mean, we talk about it in somewhat closed circles, but uh, the prospect of embedding yourself, not just in kind of understanding the landscape, the urban landscape, urban infrastructure, but embedding yourself in the process. And it's really simple, is get to know your elected officials at the, at the grassroots level, you know, your town councilor or your county supervisor or whatever the structure is that is making decisions at your level. Uh, it's shocked me in the sort of 10 years that I've been more active than I used to be. I mean, it used to be that, you know, you think as a designer, you solve the problem and it, it ought to happen by itself. Well, it doesn't happen that way. And when you start approaching elected officials, you, you know, you have lunch with them. By God, you know, they, they actually eat food. Um, you, maybe you have to give them, you know, a little bit of political support. You give them a little financial support. Uh, they, it's amazing how they open up and will talk to you. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> and it's shocking, you know, how little money <laughs> buys you access. Uh, they want your, they need your support. It's very expensive to run for office these days. So just a few bucks, you know, gets their attention. Um, but even more so is having an intelligent dialogue with somebody like you about an issue. Uh, they're faced with a plethora of, of, of totally submerging amount of issues. Um, you know, we have sort of a focused area of interest. Um, they're submerged under a million different issues. So if they sit down with somebody who gives them an intelligent point of view upon which they can base some decisions and then the, the uh, state legislature in Texas only meets every other year. They're part-time legislators. And they do everything. They cram everything into the last six weeks of the legislative session. Thousands of bills. Everything you know, from energy to you know, cockfighting or something like that. And so they're, you know, the guys, the legislator may be walking down the hall and, and they're going to vote on 100 items and they've just you know, had a phone call from you, know, you about some issue. And that's, that's the amount of information they have about a certain bill, a certain thing that's going through, um, going to be passed. So I think the distributed model, there was a model of sort of centralized decision making, network decision making, and this distributed web of decision making um, really needs to be the model. And whether the internet and all the connectivity that we have will allow that to happen, enable that to happen, um, I'm not sure because I don't see a huge amount of re-engagement in the political process. We, again, we, we have uh, voter turnout, you know, is at record lows around the country. We sort of erupt from time to time, like the whole um, uh, Wall Street movement, uh, which is a healthy sign that people are engaging in that kind of public dialogue. But the tools that we have that have been fairly effective in Houston, uh, just two years ago, we actually passed, we taxed ourselves. We didn't call it a tax, it was a user fee for drainage. Uh, there was no funding for drainage work in the city of Houston at the municipal level. We had a, a different, we had a regional flood control tax that we pay. 
Um, and here we are in the you know in a red state, very conservative, libertarian part of the government, where you know any kind of talk about new taxes um, is just death to politicians with a Tea Party out there <laughs> spilling tea leaves everywhere. But we actually passed this legislation uh, to charge ourselves to be able to fund the kinds of things that I talked about in the show. So you can do it. If you make a cogent argument, you communicate to the community, to decision makers, um, and to the general public about the need to think differently about whatever piece of the landscape infrastructure you happen to be interested in. Wendy. Uh, much like everything about this symposium, it seems that there's a building and weaving together of some very powerful messages, and maybe at the end there's one unifying theory. Um, I think there's a lot of convergences if you talk about fluidity as, as a theme, and there's a flow of materials and energy. It's the one, ways, the one way streets versus the looping cycles. The more of this you have going on in the periphery, the more resiliency I think you have. Uh, ecosystems and all natural processes really tend to be inherently very resilient and very self-buffering because of this. So we can emulate that. I think um, an, a word that has a, a, an unfortunate connotation in our culture is opportunism. Well, it's kind of American in a good way, but it's also kind of tainted. But in a sense, um, in an ecosystem, nothing will be wasted. There's a niche for every, everything. And that's ultimately an opportunistic process. And I think we as uh, designers can actually think on the, on the scale of place and time from you know, celestial system to planet to region mm -hmm. to site all the way down to the smallest levels. We can think over time from a geologic time frame to an engineering time frame to maybe a, a political time frame, all the way down to a corporate quarterly profit time frame or a sound bite you have someone's attention time frame. And actually, we need to be very opportunistic to stack all these things up or find those golden moments in time where, they lie, where there is alignment and seize it, grab it by the throat and hold on and get the message across. And I think in today's noise, in today's environment where there are so many uh, issues going around, that that's ultimately where leadership takes place. We don't have a, I'm gonna build a lighthouse engineering leadership model or even the military leadership model. In essence, to be a leader, you have to be engaged in judo with this complicated system. And you cannot call the shots, but you can say, aha, I've noticed this alignment and that's when you act, and that's when you get others to join you. Thank you. Christoph? I'm going to try and <coughs> combine one and, and three in the sense that I think that the, the decision-making, how decisions taken, you know, even if people don't have time, even if, even if you bribe them, um, how, how do those decisions really get taken? And I've always wondered about that in recent times. That was part of my reaction to this very schematic 2D, we could even say zoning plan. I mean, most decisions, at least from my experience in practice, have been based on poorly colored two-dimensional A4 sheets. Mm. Uh, and actually things get built that way. And then, and then you start asking questions once things are done. <coughs> so I think uh, an informed decision-making process based on, on, on the, this, this sort of leap in the information technology that I've shown you, um, combined also with a different way of approaching. For instance, uh, we're working in, in Jakarta right now with the same technology. And the main problem in Jakarta is not so much the muck on the surface, which is very apparent. It's actually the groundwater, the relationship between surface and groundwater. <coughs> and the fact of working on models, on three-dimensional models, you know, beyond the wow effect of what I just showed, you know, because I don't think we should stop at the wow effect. We should look at the very pragmatic, physical purpose of that, of, of that system. Being able to model the relationship between surface to groundwater, which is not really done that commonly, would be a huge progress, uh, for instance, in the city of Jakarta and probably many other places in the world. So <coughs> what I'm saying is I think combining one and three, that is to say 
developing within schools and within practices those tools and training people to understand what they're looking at on a piece of paper, which is not always really obvious. Uh, but I find the facility of that tool, being able to rotate the image, being able to relativize points of view could be of uh, immense help in any kind of participation and decisional process. Yeah, I would like to address the third question of governance and uh, stress the importance of institutions. And institutions not understood as formal institutions, but as a result of the consolidation of informal inst institutions. In that sense, institutions are a set of rules and values that shapes the behavior of people and esteem them a strong sense of belonging and develop a high capacity of cooperation. So in that sense, we are dealing with ecological systems and we need to understand that to develop these institutions, we have to bridge and bound and develop capacity of trust. In essence, we are conveying three types of knowledge in that, in that task. One is analytical. We need to explain the people uh, the complications of dealing with the soil and the different ecological systems. We also have uh, the, um, the synthetic knowledge, which is the engineering, which is the testing, which is it trying by doing. But what is more important is that we also have the symbolic knowledge, which is the design. And it is the values, the symbols that the society develops in order to deal with their built environment. I, I like to, to issue the, or to target the second issue that you opened, which is uh, the issue of flexibility and, and certain aspects that are derived from, from system theory. Uh, one of the things we like to work around is to see how these tools, uh, whether they are interface design, parametric tools, they open up, uh, because of the way in which they are linked to system theory, they open, up, they open up new questions about control and about the way in which define our cities. I mean, I think parametric tools open new domains of flexibility for the designer and really that's the bit that the student that the designer needs to learn how to harvest and what i mean harvest is thinking along the lines uh, that gregory bateson would use to define flexibility which is uncommitted potentiality for change and um, i like to stress the uncommitted side of things like bateson was uh, extremely i would say uh, moralistic around the issues of flexibility, which nowadays tends to have sort of like a diluted, but Bayson was extremely, I would say, insistent in the fact that flexibility or managing flexibility is about managing that space that we, as overall, as a common, have to evolve somatically, to, to accept change and not screw it all up right now, but actually to trace our future. So in a way, he would use even the word tyrannical to describe the way in which the manager has to manage flexibility for other aspects of the society to, in a way, thrive in a more independent manner. So, so I think rethinking and reissuing the word of flexibility and moving it away from the, I would say, from what you would tell a client, which is about, okay, you'll do whatever you want to do, which you have to tell the client, I think it's really the designer's sort of a, uh, in a way, task for the future. Great, thank you. Um, we have about 10 minutes left on this panel. We have a very large panel, as you can see. We're gonna throw it open. Uh, I'd like to borrow um, Neil's technique of taking a number of questions all at once. Um, and for the panelists, jump in. Once we have the five questions, we won't go in order. Jump in as you're inspired, okay? Uh, who has a question? This question up here. No, go ahead. In our equations that we write down to describe these systems that we're analyzing, often we use dy dx. Rarely do we use d2y dx. Almost never do we use dx dt and forget about d2x dt or Okay, so that's what I want to interject into the conversation. How the second and third order effects of the 
of the of the policies and systems that we that we develop and install. What would happen to the proposals that you are making if you if you incorporated those those second and third order effects into your analyses? Um, and I particularly well, let me let me let that go. If I have a second round. I have a second question. Great, thank you. Another question. Somebody else. Right over here. Yeah, sure. I want three more questions, so thank. Um, this question is for Wendy Goldsmith. Um, I noticed you had the, uh, the images of the uh, solar panels in Iraq, and um, <clears throat> there's sometimes you also hear about this whole conversation about the greening of the military, sustainable war, and that sort of thing. And um, I was, I'm sure you get these questions uh, all the time, so I was wondering what you could talk about that, if you could comment on that. And also, um, <clears throat> If that discussion has something to do with the kind of the broader conversation about infrastructure and um, the use of infrastructure, and maybe something about this conversation we just had about uh, flexibility and control in the client, if there's a relationship there you could comment on. Great. Another question? We are going to put uh, Dirk's question onto the table as well, asking Dirk about coastal defense. <laughs> judo. Judo. Judo, coastal judo defense. Who else? One more? Right up top. This question is for Christoph. Uh, my name is Andrea Hansen. I'm a lecturer here at the GSD, and I focus a lot in representation as well. Uh, I think lately we're not so much faced with a lack of data, but increasingly we're faced more with uh, too much data or an overflow of data. And I appreciated your juxtaposition of the Edward Imhoff uh, model, which seemed to be the more uh, abstract reading of topography versus the, the new uh, point cloud. But I'm wondering uh, how, uh, first of all, do you think it's necessary to in any way abstract this model to use it uh, for design purposes? Do you think that there's any sense that there's too much information and it becomes less of a, a tool and is, as much as a representation. Um, secondly, how do you think that this model might be uh, condensed or abstracted so that it could be uh, <coughs> imagined as something that um, it is not quite, quite so overwhelming, perhaps? Good, excellent. And one last one? Right over here, Alex. Hi. Um, so there was a couple references made, and uh, there was the reference made to anti-infrastructure, um, which I, th I thought was quite nice, and, and particularly in the age of of infrastructure degrading, decomposing, reaching the end of its natural life cycle, um, and the the notion that hard infrastructure needs to be replaced with soft infrastructure. I'm wondering if we could even take it a step further and talk a little bit about um, infrastructure that simply needs to be left to decompose on its own, um, places where you, you don't actually, in fact, have the opportunity for replacing it with uh, soft infrastructure. But in fact, there needs to be uh, sort of strategic selection made about uh, what needs to just be sort of left to, to go um, and how that can be incorporated into these larger strategies that, that do incorporate some of the more constructive techniques. So I guess I'm as asking really about um, how we integrate the, the notion of deconstruction uh, uh, or deinfrastructuralization into this discussion. Great, thanks, Alex. All right, panelists, jump in. I'll be happy to jump in with a question that was thrown directly into my lap. Um, uh, there's a reason why six years ago I decided not only that it was possible to infiltrate and influence the um, Army Corps of Engineers and ultimately through them the entire Department of Defense. I also thought it was really worthwhile. Um, they, as we heard many others make the point, they mapped out many of the roads and waterways and hence the very urban fabric and supporting infrastructures that govern the country. Um, they have uh, developed the very technology that brought us nitrogen fertilizer synthesis. <laughs> They, you know, they determined how to do this, how to how to produce nitrogen from the air for producing explosives, and it was converted to agriculture. 
They produced the large-scale machinery known as tanks during World War I. Um, it were the first time they were using that type of technology, which got converted to agricultural tractors and bulldozers subsequently. You know, so there's this, you know, they, the, the military brings us technology as we know it, including the laptops and cell phones and digital scanning technologies and computer modeling that allows us to think not only in flat snapshots in time with a crude, worse than pixelated level of detail, but allows us to think dynamically based on you know, these amazing levels of information. So the military, once you set them out a problem, <laughs> they will not only uh, stop at nothing to develop the solution, but they will drill it in to the personnel who in turn catalyze it out to society. And that's been true for racial integration and any number of other things of enormous social significance. So six years ago, it seemed like there really was a very, a very clear opportunity to take, to build upon and to assemble and repackage and project out all of the sustainable experiences that already existed within uh, the military engineering culture and history. And then what's happened even in the last three years, um, uh, they, the first time that the Army went out and actually measured how efficient their energy usage was when they started realizing they were losing m more lives and spending more money getting fuel to the battlefield than was involved with actually any fighting, per se. And they, they did some math, and they said it's actually over $400 a gallon to get diesel fuel into the theater of operations. And then they looked at how they were setting up their diesel generators, and um, somebody with their radio system had one diesel thing and it was really inefficient. It was only operating at about 20% efficiency. So you spend $400 a gallon and then you're wasting it. And how many people lost their lives or blew off a leg to get it there? This started sinking in to people, not just at the senior policy level, who in the think tanks inside and outside of the Pentagon have written in our quadrennial defense uh, review from 2010, for the first time ever, they've said, energy is not only necessary to fight wars, it is the cause of wars. Water is not only necessary for us to exist and operate supporting a battlefield scenario, but it is going to increasingly be, and it has historically been proven to be, the single force that drives people to conflict. And, and so on. So now it's like water and energy, and people are predicting that the scarcity of phosphorus, which we now treat as a waste, uh, phosphorus scarcity is going to drive um, many of the conflicts of the future, and we, better, we best be coming up with some phosphorus recovery strategies and institutionalizing those. So people, when you, when you, when you see um, surly marine colonels who say, my buddy would still be alive, if we had figured this out better seven years ago. And you have the people at the top level and the people at the field level and people like everyone in this room trying to tie it together and able to crack the code and get this done. Um, when people talk about the military getting green, there's nothing imaginary about it. There's nothing fleeting and trendy about it. I think it's very real and I, I have great hopefulness because I think that's a very transformational factor in the world as we know it. Well, I want to have a take on the uh, self-decomposing infrastructures. Uh, that, in a way, is a, a really interesting uh, question. And um, I forgot the author, but uh, there is this fantastic book, The World Without Us, that in chapter one says, well, what happens if we, from one day, to the other weren't there anymore. And then with a fantastic eye for erosive details in seven chapters uh, describes that I think in, in, in thousand years or something like that, uh, almost nothing ec except bronze statues and open pit mining uh, pits will be visible from uh, 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 well the perspective we look at culture uh, now, so in a way, 
Uh, all die infrastructure is zelf decomposing uh, on the long run. Uh, because when you are, you're not only looking to, let's say, plants, but nature is also erosion, lightning, frost, etc. So all these fantastic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, heroic uh, pieces of infrastructure are decomposing very slowly and can't be maintained forever. Uh, so um, I think that uh, um, uh, looking at the way infrastructure might be allowed to age is a very interesting thing for infrastructure designers, but also for architects. How does a building age? Does it age beautifully? Does it age elegantly? And uh, in a way, you can say that from the perspective of landscape uh, architecture, I think that I might miss one or two, but the the ten most cutting edge um, uh, uh, modern parks of the last two decades are all brownfield parks. So, in a way, this recycling of uh, brownfields goes also into uh, uh, finding other land use functions, making it into a park, etc., etc. So. It, it happens at a very slow pace. Well, just to add one thing to that, I think that I mentioned the um, Liberty State Park in New Jersey for a very specific reason. One of the very big differences between the situation in, say, Germany and the United States is the liability laws. And so uh, if you look at Pittsburgh, a lot of those old steel mills and stuff were taken down for liability purposes, whereas in Germany they were essentially uh, left intact. But a key part of what they did in Germany with the Rurgebite is it was a very long um, planning process uh, spanning almost 20 years where they got all of the various towns together to agree to a master plan. And it, so it's not just that they left them alone, but it was a planned strategized decay. And I think that's really important. And then the other uh, aspect of this is that, uh, you know, not only is it the buildings, but it's the soil. And so that the vegetation, that's one thing we know vegetation can do, is that it doesn't necessarily clean up the soil, but it, it detoxifies it. It takes a lot of those heavy metals out of circulation, binds them up with organic matter. So that's a very critical uh, ecological service that this vegetation can do and that's a you know it's mm -hmm. part of the step towards making these cities more livable in the future. Christoph, one last one. Yeah, I'd like to reassure you about point clouds. I mean, I'm I'm a <laughs> I'm a complete uh, I, I'm not a com computer nerd, I'm a computer geek. I, I've never drawn a single CAD drawing in my life. I was <laughs> trained on clear print with uh, HB and H pencils and erasers, and um, I can recognize, though, a, a change in parameters, a sort of paragon, uh, sort of a shift uh, when I see one, and I see it there for two reasons. You can simulate any kind of fluid movement within a model like that, whether it's air, whether it's water, whether it's temperature, it's an extremely powerful base. You can't ignore that. It's also a return to site planning, to topography, in the purest of ways. The, the opposite of what we saw from the sort of glacial plateau on which suburban houses get dropped on, it would force the designer to consider terrain in its crude reality as a given and to operate around those givens. So I only see advantages there. I mean, we've been training younger students, I mean, students that are between 18 and 25 with these tools uh, in, our, in our advanced master's program, and it's, it hasn't been any kind of problem. I mean, it's, it, actually, they, they pick up on the stuff within a week or two. So I wouldn't be overwhelmed by this sort of wow effect, as I said. I would trust uh, that within 10 years from now, it'll be a widespread <coughs> practice in most schools and most offices. Great. I won't be able to handle it myself, but I know it's coming. <laughs> I think um, one of my takeaways from this afternoon and really from the, the conference are the multiple opportunities that are available to all of us, to all of you, to take a very active role 
It's we we have many different modes of practice available to us, whether it's the role of advocacy, whether it's the the work that Liz showed us um, uh, this morning at the grassroots level, whether it's participating in starting leading nonprofit groups, whether it's infiltrating the Ar Army Corps of Engineers. Um, whether it's research-based practices, and we've seen a number of examples of that, or finding ways within the, the academic institutions to develop new models for thinking that can then be brought out into the world. I think that gives us an amazing set of arrays to begin to really attack this um, set of problems uh, that you've put before us today. So a uh, round of applause for the panelists. Fantastic work.